Great. Um, so thanks for bearing with me on that technical issue. So tonight's evening, we'll start with an overview of the PMBA program and then proceed to a sample lecture with um, just Professor Justin Bull, along with a Q&A session. And then we will have our alumni panel and then a short virtual question period if there's further questions at the end of the session. Uh, I am having difficulties again with the screen share, so I apologize for that. I'm going to have to restart the presentation one more time. Okay, third time's the charm, let's hope this works. Um, what's a presentation webinar without some technical difficulties? Um, so just a little bit about meeting etiquette before we start this presentation. So you might've seen this in the rotating slides at the beginning, but um, if you wanna ask just a general comment, you can put it into the chat box function um, in, in the um, webinar, but for any Q&A that you want a panelist or myself to answer, please use the Q&A function. Now, Q&A, you can either use the Q&A box or you can use the raise hand feature and one of um, my colleagues will unmute and turn on your video feed um, so you can ask the question live should you wish to do so. If you do ask your question using the, the text Q&A chat box, um, we will be answered, like I, the moderator um, would be um, asking the question on your behalf or answering the question on your behalf. Um, so just a little bit of meeting etiquette. So remember all questions should either be typed into the Q&A chat box or you can use the raise hand feature to have your question be, um, to be asked live. Um, any questions in the chat box, that's just for any kind of logistical questions that you have, all questions should be put in the Q&A um, chat box. Great, so I want to introduce you to our alumni panel that will be joining us later on tonight. Um, so we have Kevin Chang, who is a Director of Solution Management at SAP Ariba. Um, we have Mike Sally, who is a senior financing specialist at RBC. We have Aaron Kaiway, who is a software engineering manager at Intel Corporation. Um, Catherine Salinas, who is a technical product uh, manager of infrastructure and service delivery in the city of Vancouver. Felicia Granger, who is the manager of program development at Vancouver Coastal Health. And we have Nuraz Damani, who is associate director of um, transaction advisory at Leigh Fisher, and he is based out of Toronto. Um, in the room tonight, in terms of um, solder uh, staff, we have Donna Wood, who is a student experience manager of the uh, professional MBA program, um, along with Emily Spidell, who is um, the senior program assistant for the UBC professional MBA program. So um, Donna and Emily are great people to ask if you have any kind of academic questions about the program. Um, we also, from the Business Career Center, we have Ivan Yuan, who is the associate director of MBA careers. There he is right now. Hi, Ivan. Thanks for joining us. And um, we have Maria Harmer, who is the manager of MBA careers um, uh, with the Sauter Business School. And so she's responsible um, primarily for the professional MBA program. So if you have any career questions or something about your career profile or kind of career outcomes that you wanna get out of the um, PMBA program, feel free to direct your questions to Ivan or Maria. Um, from the Robert H. Lee Graduate School um, Recruitment and Admissions team, we have Keith, um, who is the Marketing and Communications Coordinator. Um, you have myself, um, I'm a Manager of Recruitment and Admissions. And then we have also have Kevin Lee, who is also a Manager of Recruitment and Admissions, and he's also answering questions in the Q&A chat box. Um, and Kevin is a fantastic person to ask your questions of the PMBA program, because Kevin himself is currently in the PMBA program. So no better endorsement for this program than when your own colleagues are actually taking the program itself. So wonderful um, staff and colleagues here to answer your questions from all different departments at um, UBC Sauter. So absolutely throughout the course of this evening, do take the opportunity to pose your questions to um, our different staff members uh, from different units um, who will be supporting you if you join the uh, PMBA program at UBC. So why uh, UBC um, PMBA program? Well, as you um, many of you know, the PMBA program is the part-time version of our MBA program. So it's designed to be um, done in conjunction with a full-time work schedule. 
So it's a 24 month program, so two years, and the classes are just on this um, weekends only. And the idea is to allow you to learn, get a strategic business education that can help advance your career, but also allow you the opportunity to use your own workplace as kind of a living laboratory for you to um, apply new ideas, apply new concepts, and gradually prove yourself ready for that next step in your career and prove yourself ready for that promotion. So we do that through a very strong focus on experiential learning so the idea of learning by doing so it's a case-based method um, there's global opportunities that are available through the program should you wish to expand your um, kind of learning um, beyond the borders of Canada and then a very strong focus on personalized career development because most of you are considering this MBA program because you have very specific career goals that you want to achieve by doing an MBA so Something that's really um, fantastic about the UBC MBA program, for many of you, you're considering this program um, from maybe a local lower mainland Vancouver um, uh, area, because obviously the program has a very strong local reputation. But something that really sets us apart from all the other programs that you're considering in kind of the local area is also our very strong global reputation as well. So with this program, you get both a, a very strong, um, you know, world renowned uh, MBA and strategic um, degree that can help you, that has a very strong track record of moving students ahead in their careers, but it's also a degree that's globally recognized. So you might think maybe you're more locally oriented, but you do want to prepare yourself the best for the future. So better have all angles covered. And with this degree, it is a globally recognized degree and it has a tremendous um, kind of global reputation. We're ranked top 45 global elite by the QS Global Business School rankings, number one in Canada for business econo and economics. And we do have 43,000 alumni in about 80 countries around the world. And that's just the solder alumni network. Um, the larger UBC alumni network is even greater than that. It's 300,000 alumni in 140 countries around the world. So how the program works is, like I mentioned earlier, it is um, a weekend schedule. So you can see that you would have classes kind of um, three weeks on, three weeks off. So, and Saturday, Sunday only. So week one, you'd have a cl um, um, two classes, Saturday, Sunday, then you get a break, classes, break, classes, and then two weeks break. And then on the eighth week, you'll be on to your online assessments. So it's um, approximately two classes on an eight week cycle is how you can think about this. So these are shorter than your typical semester, um, like 13 week semesters that you would have been um, more familiar with during your undergrad. So they are kind of more robust and, and shorter kind of um, pe uh, module periods of eight weeks approximately. So you can see by this schedule, you're not, actually, you're not actually in classes every weekend. There are weekends that you have off. So that does work quite well when you are, you know, trying to balance work life and school that, you know, you will have some weekends off and that, um, you know, if, for example, you had commitments outside of Vancouver or you traveled quite extensively for work, um, a lot of our students with that type of schedule in the past have made that work because it's not every single weekend that you would have to be um, in class in Vancouver. So we are global. Um, so there's a number of different global opportunities that you can get engaged with in the PMBA program. Um, one is uh, the Global um, Network of Advanced uh, Management, um, uh, which is a partnership that we have with Yale. And then we have another one that is a study abroad program. So in terms of the Global Network of Advanced Management, that's a network of approximately 30 leading business schools spearheaded by the Yale School of Management. And it includes top institutions like Yale, Berkeley, H HKUST, HSA, Oxford. So some really top business schools all around the world. And they allow you the opportunity um, to go on what are called global network weeks or even do courses online. So all of these international opportunities that I'm gonna talk about in the PMB program are optional because obviously a lot of you are, um, you know, working full time, the vast majority are working full time. So you might not have the opportunity to, to go for abroad for very long, but the Genome Network Weeks are very popular because they are only a one week long and kind of on a robust kind of thematic topic area. And they do count back as elective credits towards your MBA. But even if you couldn't go abroad, you can still engage with the Network Weeks by doing a small network online course as well. So some examples of some Genome Network Week um, th themes um, include, uh, you know, digital transformation at IE University. We had um, 
Berkeley doing Bay Area um, innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, and then we have UBC also doing a network week on sustainability. So you can see that they often have a regional or institutional bent to the different topic areas. So you can choose one if you were really interested in, um, you know, digital transformation in from a, like a top tier European school, you might choose IE University. Or if you were really interested in the Asian markets, you might want to choose one of our partners in Asia as well. We do have 36 exchange partners all around the world. Um, all, most continents are covered except for Antarctica. So if you did want to see the penguins in Antarctica, you'd probably have to do that on your own time. But um, other continents are all covered. Oceania, Africa, Europe, South America, Asia. So anywhere you want to go, we'd likely have a partner there. And exchange can be as short as two weeks up to a whole semester. So depending on how much time you could, um, you can swing it, or if you had some vacation time, or even some, some students have explored the idea of they had, um, you know, their company had a branch in another country country, that could be an option you can explore with your employer as well. So these are some of our um, examples of some of our network partners for study abroad. Um, so Copenhagen Business School is one, Essex University in Paris is also a very popular choice among our students. So this program has a very strong focus on experiential learning. So that's the idea of learning by doing. And um, one of the ways we do this is uh, through a very strong case-based method. And you can see through the program journey that there are these um, ideas of residencies in the beginning, middle, and end of the program. So what these residencies are, are they are week-long intensive learning periods. We do expect you to take that week off of work um, to kind of do a deep dive into the topic area in kind of the beginning, middle, and end of the program. So they serve two purposes, these, um, these residencies. One is pedagogical, like, you know, you get to learn in a very condensed manner, almost like in a full-time MBA program. And then another one is to kind of bring the cohort together. So those of you that have done research into the UVP of an MBA know that one of the most important things that you get out of doing an MBA is the network itself. So we're trying to help you build your MBA cohort and those relationships early in the program and then reinforce it with these intensive learning periods in the middle and end of the program as well. So um, they are intensive learning periods, highly rewarding, and um, it gives our part-time students something of a full-time um, full experience while they are doing a program part-time. Now this is the first year of the program that you're looking at on the screen here. So the first year are your foundational um, courses in um, your MBA curriculum. So you see you've got your business basics in accounting, entrepreneurship, statistics, um, building high performance teams, finance, marketing. So those are your kind of core MBA courses. And then you can see in the second year, you'll get into more advanced module courses. So these are all the courses you'd be taking if you were to join the MBA in January, 2021. All right, they're all listed here. Now, what I would want to mention is that if you are interested in taking some more elective courses or courses outside of the ones that are listed here, you're welcome to do so starting in the second year. All the courses that are available to our full-time courses are also open to our professional MBA students. The only limitation would be your own schedule. So if there was a course you want to take um, in, you know, for example, our tech entrepreneurship track, which is, um, like our tech entrepreneurship course is a very popular course. Um, you, that's, that's usually scheduled in the evening. So our more popular MBA courses are scheduled in the evening so that um, our, our PMBA students can also take them. So you can swap out one of these second year courses for um, another course with the full-time MBA cohort. Or even if you wanted to, there's a, like me, obviously many other departments at UBC. So you can take courses, like if there is a course in the Faculty of Law, for example, that you're really interested in, as long as you get the permission of the professor and you get it approved by your academic um, manager, then you can also take that course and have that credited towards your MBA. So that's an, another unique factor about um, being at a school like UBC is that it's a comprehensive research unity, university it's a thought leader in innovation around the world. So there's many diverse departments that are world class that if you meet the prerequisites for, you want to get involved with that. Let's say you're a computer science graduate and there was a course in AI in the de um, Department of Computer Science that you want to take. Um, it's possible that you, as long as you get the permission of the instructor and of your academic manager, you can take that course and have that credited towards your MBA as well. So approximately one third of your program can actually be taken outside of the business school. 
So those are some opportunities there um, in terms of the program curriculum. You can see that um, there's a very strong focus throughout the course of the program on career and professional development. So it runs the course of the program. And then also that support of our full service business career center is available to you for the rest of your career. So that's something that you really can't even put a price on because that's lifelong support and access to a world-class business network um, that is global in nature that you would have access to and you would have the support of for the rest of your career, even after you graduate from the program. Now you can see in this second year is also when you can start some of the global programming. So if you want to, you can start some of the global network weeks, um, which are when you go abroad. And there's also the small online network courses as well. And if you wanted to, there is also the opportunity in the second year to um, do your study abroad. Now you can also see from this journey that there are proper breaks scheduled into the program. So all of August is off in the first year, um, all of August is off in the second year, and it, it's hard to see in this split, but there's also a December break as well in your first year. So personalized career coaching is an integral part of this program. I've already introduced you to Ivan and Maria who work at the Business Career Center, but um, you'll be working very closely with them in terms of identifying what your career goals are and they would connect you with people, uh, strategic members of our alumni network, of our business network, um, that can kind of give you insights to um, different companies or roles that you might be interested in and connect you with mentorship programs as well. And they also run a variety of training programs and um, career development workshops that, um, that you can get involved with, uh, with through the BCC. Now, um, unsurprisingly, because of this idea of, you know, working while you um, do your MBA and kind of building strategic skills as you go through the program, 90% of our students actually get a career promotion or advancement during the 24 months of the program. So the vast majority of our students actually get promoted in program. Now you can see that the career changes generally take um, two forms. Um, they fall in two broad categories. One would be career changers. So those are people that are generally moving um, industry and companies and into different types of job roles. And then career promoters. Um, those are people that are generally happy with the company that they're working for and they see opportunity for advancement within that company. And so they generally move from more operations related roles to more strategic and leadership roles by the, by the end of the program. So you can see some examples here, someone who who was um, uh, you know, a mechanical design engineer at an electronics manufacturer, became an engineering manager at Google in terms of a career change. Um, so you can see a career shift in industry as well. And um, someone that uh, was a manager of power utilities um, at an asset management company became a VP of asset management at that same company post-program. So you can again see whether it's a career changer or a career promoter, that clear shift from more operational roles to more leadership strategy roles by the end of the um, PMBA program. So this is what um, the class profile of the UBC PMBA program looks like. Um, last year we had a class of about 60 people, average uh, years of work experience was 8.5. And um, you can see a variety of um, undergraduate uh, majors, uh, as well as work experience by industry. So one of the questions I often get is whether there's a right age to do an MBA. And there's no correct age to do an MBA. Whether you are 27 or you are 52, when you are ready to benefit from what this program offers is the right time to do the degree. So if you're younger in your career, but you feel like you're ready for this kind of like strategic business education, because it's not just an education, it's a strategic move in your career. So when you feel like you're ready for that next move in your career, you're ready to start building towards that, 27 can be the right age for you versus someone maybe in their 50s or like already at the c-suite sometimes they they need that strategic education maybe they had gotten to the c-suite through you know expert you know industry expertise and now they're at this leadership role and they need the strategic business education to learn how to run an enterprise so 50 was the right age for that person so there's no right age to do the mba if you do ever have a question about that always send me an email and we can always chat one-on-one -on -one about um you know your uh, strategic the strategic benefit to you doing the MBA wherever you are in um, in your career. Uh, I got a message from my colleague that someone has raised their hand, so I'm happy to take a question right now. Keith, if you can unmute this person. Or I'll just continue, I'll just continue. until Keith unmutes. Do we have the person on, online? Hey, hi Vivian. I just uh, had a query uh, and I wanted to know whether this program, the career development part of it, would it help you figure out uh, whether changing um, changing your field is the right move or maybe in some cases if you want to turn to entrepreneurship, if that's a correct decision for your career? 
Yeah, so when you approach the career decision, you kind of want to have done some thinking about what it is you truly want out of your career, right? So most people entering the program, they've done a lot of thinking about this. They've done a lot of soul searching and research. They've talked to like an advisor like myself, for example, and we would have gone through some of the questions to see like what it is you really want. You could be kind of a career searcher as well, but you want to have some ideas in mind. Some people like they actually change their like their minds partway through the program as well. They they never saw themselves as an entrepreneur. They only were um, after like a strict you know a kind of a career change, and then suddenly they decided that um, they they do want to be an entrepreneur. But I see Ivan's on online right now, so maybe Ivan, you can um, shed some light on on that question as well. Yeah, that's a good question as well, and I think part of the. Uh, regardless of what did you decide to choose, I think, uh, first of all, if you're looking for, you know, basic business uh, foundations, uh, whether it's to start your own business or even within your own uh, current role or industry, um, the MBA is a great uh, foundation to be uh, to, 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 to develop and to grow. When it comes to uh, entrepreneurship, and that's something that our career um, managers, including Maria, who's like, uh, with us here today, I uh, can kind of walk each individual student through some of those decision-making processes. And, some, and each person's situation is going to be very different. There's going to be different factors that are going to uh, be considered as good, including family, including the um, uh, the, the I guess industry as well as uh, the, the time that uh, it's going to be required uh, to put into a startup. Right. Thanks for um, thanks for your input, Ivan. So hopefully that sheds some light for you um, in terms of your question about career changes and when that generally happens. Uh, the career center is always there to kind of advise when you know a new idea comes up or um, or you need some support or feedback about something that has to do with your career. Great. So thank you so much. Thanks, Vivian. Thanks, Ivan. Great. Um, so. You know, everybody knows about Vancouver already. Most likely you are joining us from a kind of a Vancouver um, environment, but just to kind of go through, the sector is growing in Vancouver. Um, you know, we are a magnet for new investments or new branches from large companies, but also a very strong um, startup and incubator hub, just because among the West Coast um, technological and innovation hub cities, you know, like Vancouver, Seattle, San Francisco, we do have the lowest cost of doing business. I mean, by some virtue, because of the unfortunate weakness in the Canadian dollar, which plays to, to industry advantage. So that disadvantage can become our advantage. It has been our advantage. So um, it's a great city to continue to grow your career, or for those of you that are from outside the Vancouver area, to start your career um, in a city where there's, um, there's a lot to love and there's a lot to look forward to. So I won't want to get into too many of the admissions requirements. I'm just going to leave this up here for you because we are kind of running a little bit low on time. Um, but just briefly, we are, these are guidelines. So one, one thing I want you to know about these, um, these kind of numbers here are that there are guidelines. So if your GPA is kind of below the kind of 76% average, it is not a deal breaker. Like, you know, you can always mitigate the lower scores by just scoring higher in the GMAT or GRE. So competitive standards would be a 650 in the GMAT or a 320 on the GRE with minimum GMAT 550, GRE 300. Um, one thing I would note is for the GRE, we only look at the verbal and the quantitative sections. So if, if you're really panicked about the integrated reasoning section, if you're only applying to us, we don't look at that section. So if that eases your mind a little, that's something I want to mention as well. Um, always leave enough time for a rewrite when you're doing these standardized tests. It's quite common for us to see people write this more than once, like two or three times is not uncommon. So leave enough time when you're doing your test prep to actually um, you know, do a rewrite if you need it. Rule of thumb, when you're looking at the questions for the standardized tests, if you're, if you're not from a quants oriented background, you look at those questions, you have no idea where to start. Um, it, that's a good kind of signal that you might need some prep. And UBC Robson Square does offer some really good um, prep courses that can take you, um, that can give you a guided approach to your GMAT GRE prep minimum of two years of professional work experience and two professional references and then a small variety of written and video essays so if I can give you some tips on the written essays just make sure you pay attention to grammar make sure that you do answer the question if you want to know whether you answer the question you can ask someone that doesn't know what the question is to read your essay and if they can figure out what the question was then you've answered the question so that's just a little tip there um, English proficiency test, if you did not do your degree in English, um, then you would be looking at writing either the IELTS, ac academic, or the TOEFL. IELTS, we're looking for a score of seven, and then TOEFL, a score of 100. A personal interview is um, the last part of the application process. So here is the final deadline coming up, which is October 13th. 
And then we do a final document deadline of uh, November 17th. Um, so fees, um, Canadian residents um, and permanent um, Canadian citizens or permanent residents, you're looking at a fee of 49000 Now, I want to stress that this is actually the full program fee, because I know if those of you that have done research into like top tier programs in Canada are like, how come the price is half price? Well, that's because this program is located in British Columbia. Um, and so, as you know, um, you know, uh, education is governed by the provinces. So in the province of British Columbia, there's a, there's a cap on how much we can charge for domestic tuition. So you are effectively getting a really good deal for this degree that is the full program cost. Um, so, you know, in, when you look at it compared to other top tier educations, it is a significant discount. Great, so um, that's my contact information. So if you ever want to reach out to me, I really encourage you to do so, especially if you want to just have you know, a one-on-one -on -one discussion about your profile, readiness for the program, or any other questions about the program or admissions, I do encourage you to get in touch with me directly and set up a meeting. Um, great, so I do have a few, like a couple minutes now for some questions, if anybody has uh, any questions that they, they might have. Um, just gonna check the Q&A chat box to see if there's... Uh, Hello, can I, so this person's asking um, for the specifications for writing the essay and video on the website. There are some guidelines when you start the application. So that's something that you can use as a guide. When you, when you do the online applications, we have a sample resume as well. So they would give you the guidelines right there on the application. And then the, another person is asking for how many applicants have received offers for the uh, PMBA. So I can't tell you the exact number, but I'll tell you that um, last year we did end up with a wait list. And then this year, if there's even more interest in the program, so we're anticipating that it might happen again. So I would encourage everyone that's considering this program to try to apply early if possible. But again, always apply with your strongest application possible. Class size, I got a question on that. Um, so the entire cohort is in one class and um, it's approximately 50 to 60 people in the, in the classroom. Um, another question is about how COVID will uh, impact the PMBA session of um, 2021, so January 2021 to um, January uh, so to 2022. Um, so right now um, we are modeling different scenarios. The idea is hopefully we would be able to bring everybody in in person in January. So that is our best scenario that we are modeling for right now. But obviously we have to model contingencies as well. We do not know like if there's going to be a, a large second wave. If we go back into lockdown, then obviously we will be following the guidelines of the provincial health authorities. So it depends a lot on COVID, how COVID rolls out in British Columbia, and whether they're um, whether the Provincial health authorities will allow us to have in-person classes. And then a question is, do you have to be a Canadian resident to apply to the program? The answer is no. In fact, we have had international students apply to the program and we're on the program on um, uh, study permits. And the good thing is uh, sometimes students that are coming in with study permits, um, they're bringing their whole family, just so people know, um, under the Canadian Study Permit Program, your spouse or common law partner is eligible for a full-time work permit. So your spouse can actually work while you study, and you yourself are eligible for um, 20 hours a week of work in Canada under the Canadian Study Permit regulations. Um, so I need to end the, the, my portion of the presentation now just to make time for our um, guest lecturer, um, Justin Bull. So we will be continuing to answer the questions um, through the chat box Q&A as the presentation goes on. But right now, I'd like to invite Justin Bull to, um, to, uh, to join us um, for this webinar. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Vivian. Uh, thank you for that overview and all those great questions. Uh, really nice to see all that level of interest. Let me just share screen here and we can get right into it. You're, everyone's talking about COVID. Vivian, by the way, how long do I have? I forget. I'm, I'm terrible. Uh, with them. You have 45 minutes, Justin. 45 minutes. Holy smokes. Okay, 45 <laughs> minutes. Uh, I'll do my best to keep it less than that so we can have some questions at the end. Uh, we're, everyone is concerned about COVID, obviously, and so why not talk about it directly as opposed to dancing around it like a lot of us are and pretending it's not out there. But what I want to do today is actually think about what does COVID tell us about the future of our economy and the future of sustainability. So those are the big questions we're going to address today. 
So what we want to do by the end of this session is essentially learn three key things. We want to learn what kind of key messages does COVID-19 reinforce about the issues of sustainability? What can we learn about this, this big thing, like the climate crisis, the ocean plastic crisis, the biodiversity crisis, collapse in ecosystems, all these things that, were, that are sort of front in mind. Well, can we learn something about that thinking about COVID? Finally, uh, secondly, we want to work through some of these development pathways that the economy is going to go through. What's the recovery going to look like? Is it going to be uneven? What, what kind of models and frameworks can we bring to bear uh, when thinking about the next 12, 24, 36, 48 months? And maybe a little speculation, uh, if you'll indulge me, on where it is we might go from here. So key messaging, that's the first idea. So one of the things that those of us who study sustainability have, have always uh, tried to to get across to our audiences, whether it was in the private sector, public sector, whether it's students or colleagues or managers or investors, is that there's this level of integration connection between most of our natural systems, human systems, and economic systems, and that if we acknowledge and manage for those connections, we'll do much better. But if we ignore them, we do so at our peril. And COVID-19 is now the, the perfect example because suddenly everybody has this, this much more acute and heightened understanding of just how interconnected the success of our societies are with the success of our economies with natural forces like, for example, a virus and how something could potentially transfer from a pangolin to a bat, a bat to a human, and then through air travel and interconnected uh, sort of globalized societies, everything just goes so quickly and we end up in a position where within six months we go from everything is just dandy and the stock markets are doing fantastic, although they're still doing fantastic, and we'll talk about that later, to a shutdown. And now a very tentative reopening and a lot of fear around that. So now suddenly everyone intuitively understands that everything is in, uh, connected. So the question is, are we gonna are we gonna listen to scientists once again? Because I found this paper, and this went viral not that long ago, no, no pun intended, uh, about SARS, severe, severe acute respiratory syndrome, uh, coronavirus as agent of emerging and re-emerging infection. And notice the date, it's a little small here, I've highlighted in orange, October 2007. And from the concluding paragraph, the presence of a large reservoir of SARS-CoV like viruses and horseshoe bats together with the culture of eating exotic animals in Southern China is a time bomb. So here we are, uh, what, what are we, 14 years ago? Uh, 13 years ago, where scientists were doing the work and they were saying, this is going to happen. Many of you will have seen uh, Bill Gates' famous TED Talk where he says, this is going to happen. This is, this is coming for us. We, we're just not prepared. And yet we ignore all of these warnings. Well, pandemics aren't as exciting uh, and certainly have not been getting as much attention prior to COVID as climate. And yet everybody has been talking about climate for a very long time. And so this is going to force the business community, every industry, to uh, sort of go through a bit of a transition because everyone had a sustainability policy. Everyone cared about sustainability. Uh, you know, CEOs would talk about it on calls with investors and investors would ask questions about it. But there was this reality, which is that like you had to get profit first and, and that's still the reality. But as long as you're getting profit and you cared a little bit about the planet, a little bit about people, you were going to be okay. You're going to just sort of hum along uh, business as usual. Not a lot of attention was going to be placed on you as long as you were saying the right things about sustainability. We were hoping to sort of drive people towards this middle column where we had an area where people, plan and profit were considered of equal importance and that we would take these issues and we would balance them effectively and we would teach people about the tools to do that effectively. But what COVID taught us, I think, was a really interesting and perhaps actually more logically correct uh, definition of sustainability, which is that, look, your, your business, your economy is a subset of what society can tolerate. And what society can tolerate is very much influenced by the natural world. And so whether it takes the form of uh, a virus or massive increases in extreme weather or sea level rises or all the other sort of ecological crises that we understand are coming and we have been adequately warned about, we now suddenly have this much more, it's logically correct, it's just difficult to implement. It's a little harder to make it technically useful, but we can learn this lesson, right? COVID taught us this lesson that we, we ignore the stability of our societies and our planet at our peril. Fortunately, we now understand this notion of flattening the curve. 
right? Where everybody understood that if we overwhelm hospital resources, we have too many people get sick too quickly, hospital hallways get full of people and there's not enough ventilators, there's not enough PPE. So, you know, maintain social, social distancing, wear some masks, only see half as many people as you used to, uh, quarantine if you feel poorly, and we cannot overwhelm hospital resources. That was the story. That was this flattening of the curve, which some countries, uh, did very well at other countries yeah, obviously did not do a particularly effective job. But when this was all happening, climate communicators were, were trying to jump on this bandwagon and say, hey, let's flatten this curve too. We understand that with business as usual, we're going to overwhelm Earth's, this Earth system's ability to absorb our pollution as well continuing to meet the needs of, of people and provide food and clean air and clean water. And let's not overtax our planet and instead prioritize sustainability so that we can create economies that meet people's needs well, uh, while not exceeding Earth's carrying capacity. So again, this is now a concept that was very sort of ephemeral and difficult and perhaps even inaccessible to people who weren't in the trenches on sustainability. And now suddenly it's quite easy for us to understand. Because COVID gave us all sorts of powerful and poignant imagery and, and lessons about just what happens when, when, when scarcity hits, right? When, when a previously abundant resource is no longer so abundant. Uh, obviously, there was this sort of global phenomenon of everyone being panicked that they were going to run out of uh, uh, toilet paper. It's apparently, they didn't get the memo that COVID is a respiratory uh, disease as opposed to one that affects the digestive tract, but nonetheless, they just felt that like toilet paper is going to be an issue. And the run on, on this was, was obviously well documented. It was both tragic and hilarious. But that's toilet paper. What happens when food is scarce? What happens when clean water is scarce? What happens when clean air is scarce? Those are much more serious issues. And so if COVID can teach us anything, it's that humans do not respond well to scarcity. So there is an urgent argument for starting to do something now about resources that might become scarce in the future. And many of those resources are uh, provided by these systems which we're talking about conserving and protecting. Because look, consider this six step process. Scientists warn us about something. People cover up and deny. Reality becomes too difficult to ignore. The solution is expensive, but the longer we wait, the more expensive it gets and we eventually act. Now it could be describing either COVID or climate, right? We understood that something was going on in China as early as December, but there was a lot of denial. We understood that it had reached the shores of Europe and, and North America as early as early February, but there was denial. But then suddenly you start seeing serious outbreaks, super spreader events, whether it's in Korea or in Italy or New York. And suddenly, boy, is this real. You can't ignore it anymore. You can't just say we're going to bottle this up and it's not a problem. Now, the solution was clearly very expensive, right? 10 to 15 percent uh, loss in GDP gross domestic product because we essentially locked economies down. But the other thing is that the longer you wait, the more expensive it gets. The more you let this disease spread, uh, the longer a lockdown has to last in order for the numbers to come back uh, into something that medical systems can actually deal with. So we act. And different countries acted at different points in time for, for different reasons, strong leadership, strong social uh, cohesion, strong levels of trust in government were some strong indicators of uh, countries that were going to manage this successfully. Weak leadership, weak uh, social trust, weak trust in government were indicators that you're going to manage this poorly. But the big difference between what's going on with climate and COVID is just the this pace at which this is unfolding. Like the Rio Earth Summit was in 1992 when, you know, we're talking almost 30 years ago when everyone's like, hey, carbon emissions are a problem. And a lot of energy went into saying, no, they're not. You know, we'll solve this with technology. It's not really a problem. But now suddenly, as, 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 as we, Canada lost its last permanent ice sheet in the Arctic uh, this, this last week, uh, California is in the midst of yet again a historical fire season. Uh, different places are having absolutely unseasonal temperatures. We're seeing average temperatures much higher across the world. It is becoming very difficult to ignore that something is happening and something has changed. So check your verb tense when it comes to climate change, right? Sometimes it's looking like past. So what does this mean for economies? Well, this was classic. Everyone by now has heard about the V's and the U's and the W's and the L's in terms of trajectories for, for economic recovery. 
right? The, the, the optimists, the people who thought that we would just shut down, the disease would go away, a vaccine would quickly become available, and then everything would go back to normal. They suggested we were going to go through a V-shaped recovery, right? Decline in activity, and then a quick bounce back up. People who are a little more worried that said, you know what, vaccines might take a little longer. The effects of this are going to be even more uh, difficult to manage than we anticipated. They said, maybe it's a U, right? Maybe we go through a longer slump. The W seems like a, an interesting scenario where we open up, we shut down, we open up, we shut down. We think we've got this under control. Turns out we don't. And so economic activity vacillates, right? We call that the, the hammer and the dance has been another sort of analogy that's being used here. The L, I suppose, for, from a financial perspective and a sort of a issue of economic activity, the L scenario is a frightening one where COVID literally just you know, results in a drop in activity and we never fully recover. And then there's one that I, I don't mention here, but it's uh, one that I heard about just last week, which was a K-shaped recovery. So indulge me here just for a moment. Think about uh, the letter K where, you know, after a bit of a, dis depending on the font type, of course, but uh, after a, a drop down, you have part of the economy moving up and part of it moving down. And so COVID for the wealthy, COVID for the investor class, COVID for people whose wealth is coming primarily from stock markets and dividends, they haven't experienced any really negative effects. They've actually done quite well. The people who are frontline workers, vulnerable workers, minimum wage workers who have to put their health on the line in order to go back to work, this has been a very different process. But the reality is, is that whether it's V or U or W or L, every firm, every economy, every country, every career is going to follow a different trajectory. And indeed, one of the reasons you're here right now is you're asking what kind of trajectory is my career going to follow? How do, I, how, do I, how do I engage in a professional development recovery? How do I leverage this moment of, of transformative change where all sorts of new technologies and business models and market conditions and international trade conditions and political conditions are coming along and rapidly changing the baseline to which I have been accustomed? Now, no one really knows what the clear answer to that is, but there are a few sort of tests that you can conduct to sort of interrogate uh, your assumptions. I, I think the first test that you can ask is like, is my industry dependent on the need for large gatherings in order to earn revenue? That's a, if, if you are, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. That's going to be a tough one. and It's going to take time to recover. Another important test that you ask yourself is the industry I'm in or my, uh, is my company well aligned with priorities in terms of government stimulus? We are going to see, we have seen and will continue to see unprecedented injections of capital into economies, all sorts of fiscal and monetary stimulus. And the government can't save everyone. They're going to try. They're going to pretend they try with, the, with certainly from a worker's perspective, CERB uh, in, in Canada was an effort at giving everybody money quickly, right? To keep, you know, people paying rent and food on their table. And that was the right thing to do, but they're not going to be able to do endless wage support for every sector of the economy in perpetuity. Because one of the deeper things that's going to happen here is that there's going to be shifts in consumer preferences and buying power. Will consumers want to buy different kinds of products or different kinds of goods? Are consumers going to uh, experience a kind of decline in their economic wealth and, and their sense of confidence and prosperity that fundamentally shifts how it is they're willing to spend money? Another interesting question that you can sort of ask is like, look, how is COVID going to change how we think about supply chains and this notion of economic efficiency? Because the traditional definition of economic efficiency was go to the lowest cost operating environment uh, and, 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 and buy at scale. But not having those relationships with suppliers, having long, uh, sort of opaque global supply chains, suddenly we're learning in the midst of COVID that that's not necessarily an advantage. You may have uh, pursued the almighty dollar at the expense of not being able to be very resilient in the face of shocks. And so there's a lot of conversation going on right now about relocalization of economic activity, like that every country should have the ability to manufacture certain things, to feed certain number of people, to essentially be able to take care of itself uh, themselves. And so this, this era of unfettered globalization and the free movement of goods and ideas and services around the world seems to be subject to some kind of a revision. And what that revision looks like is going to influence a lot of companies, a lot of firms, a lot of industries, and a lot of careers. So anytime you are 
confronted with a complicated and, and interconnected problem like COVID, the first thing that we do when we try and teach you strategy and, and to work your way through a messy problem like this is to conduct what we call a pestle analysis. Right? You, when there's no easy answer, when there's no math you can conduct, where there's no single report that's going to answer this, what you need to do is take a broad perspective and look at a lot of different dimensions. And a great way to organize that kind of thinking is politically, economically, social, technological, legal, and environmental. So we can conduct pestle analysis at different time frames. We can look at the short term and we can see that politically COVID has created strong governments Right? People, suddenly uh, we are looking to the public sector for providing some very vital services and we are, we are re reawakening to the importance of a strong government, but they're also highly leveraged, unprecedented levels of debt. We're seeing, in fact, some branches of government uh, facing potential liquidity crises. Cities in particular, which are, have a much diff more difficult time in Canada issuing debt, are now going to face a cash crunch as their revenues go down through declining in perhaps property taxes, either from commercial or residential taxpayers. We're also seeing politically in the short term that government can, in fact, quickly change regulations in the face of a crisis. And sometimes those regulations are just getting tossed aside in order to open up economic activity or allow consumers to buy things in ways that they previously did not. We are seeing unprecedented volatility in markets, and this is going to continue to be the case, and demand destruction, right? So it, it's a, like a little bit of a roller coaster, and it feels like we're sort of teetering on the edge at the moment. And demand destruction essentially means that you're looking at certain sectors of the economy. The classic one is going to be cruise ships, where it may never come back to the extent that it used to be. Airlines already are suggesting that business travel is never going to return to the extent that it used to be. Uh, personal travel, tourism, et cetera, maybe it'll bounce back. But I was listening to an interview with the CEO of Delta, a large American airline recently said, we never expect it to come back. So they're preemptively shutting down certain parts of their fleets and, and reallocating assets and capital and having to make very hard decisions. The reality is, is that across the board, we're in uncharted territory. From a social perspective, we understand that in the short term, there's a lot of suffering. But the physical distancing is, is keeping families apart. It's making it more difficult for them to celebrate. It's creating isolation. It's creating mental health challenges. Now, not only are families apart, but now people are spending way more time with their families than they ever have before, and which is creating a whole new uh, layer of complexity. Perhaps certain people, like divorce lawyers, are going to do a wonderful job uh, on the other end of this. Technologically, if you were a, a firm that was already connected, Right? If you were already well positioned to innovate because you use technology or you had technology that could scale, if you had a business model that went virtual easily, you've done very well. And as a result, so much more of our economy, more of our commercial economy, more of our food is moving online, more of our commerce and buying and retail, clothing, everything is going online. So this, this notion that software eats everything is just being enhanced and reinforced further. Legally, we're seeing a lot of boundaries being tested, governments moving into seg segments of the economy that they wouldn't have had before, uh, competitive behaviors between firms changing as we start seeing a decrease in, in sort of enforcement of antitrust law as pharmaceutical firms start actually collaborating and working together to make these, uh, sort of try and develop vaccines, et cetera. There's, there's all sorts of legal uncertainty around the liability of COVID-19, right? If I get sick at someone's business, can I sue them? If I get sick at my own employer, can I sue them? If I get sick at school, what are the consequences? So we're trying to figure out those legal liabilities. Fortunately, in Canada, we have a much more sensible form of tort law. In other jurisdictions, the legal liabilities of COVID are going to be significant. From an environmental perspective, we saw that the shutdown that COVID brought about immediately brought about immediate and significant decline in localized air pollution, primarily like nitrogen dioxide, which is a, uh, a nasty air pollutant that's very bad for people's lungs. We saw wildlife starting to return to urban areas. Even in Vancouver, we saw for the first time, for example, orca whales up the Burrard Inlet, which is well past downtown Vancouver, heading towards the, the Coast Mountain Range in Port Moody. And orca whales had been seen there for decades. And because of the decrease in shipping traffic and, uh, and, uh, and marine traffic in general, uh, they returned. Longer term, this is where you really have to sort of look into that, that crystal ball and, and, and try and make some intelligent guesses. But the reality is, is that somewhere along the line here, governments are going to have to make difficult choices. The notion uh, Justin, of Justin, there's a raised hand for you if, if you're open to taking a question right now. Uh, sure. Go ahead, please. Great. Just give us a second to unmute the individual. 
Hey, uh, hi, Justin. I had a question, not a question, but generally because you were talking about how this impacts uh, governments. Do you think uh, from a sustainability point of view, governments will also have to start thinking about decongesting cities because that's where the highest impact of COVID was seen and that has always been an issue mm -hmm. when it comes to pollution control or, or disease control as it is? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a great question. I think that will happen at different levels of government. You're, you're looking at, yeah, I, I was reading reports about office occupancy in midtown Manhattan, which had some of the most expensive real estate uh, office space in the world. And even with reopening and COVID safety protocols, a lot of workers just don't want to come back. So the decongestion of urban areas could happen just because of a change in social preference. Uh, or that a lot of people just realize that, hey, why was I getting up at 6 a.m. every morning to get on a subway to go to work when I could just, you know, only go to work two days a week or three days a week or have a hybrid or more flexible uh, work life. So I think that that kind of decongestion could happen naturally for, for uh, that, that's my suspicion, as opposed to it being something that uh, government plays a role in. Are, are there other okay. questions, Vivian? I can't see uh, a list. Not at the moment, Justin. We're uh, we're good to go. Okay, because I, I I promise we're going to try and get through this relatively quickly so that we can uh, have a Q and A because that's probably where we're going to have the most fun here. Where was okay, it? Long term pestle analysis. So again, we're peering into the crystal ball. Governments are going to make uh, uh, difficult choices. I think austerity will be in the cards, not next year, or the year after that. But when Canada suddenly is running a deficit that's completely unprecedented, people are going to start saying, we got to tighten belts or raise taxes. Something's going to happen. How a, a leader or a political party managed COVID-19 is going to become a litmus test, right, in terms of how people perceive their competence and their ability to govern. Economically, I think we're going to see winners and losers. I think there's going to be sectors that actually grow. Technology has been growing through the last six months because uh, their their ability to deliver value at relatively low margins through vir purely virtual means is, is has been very competitive for them. And I think that there's other sectors where their decline is just going to be accelerated. I think the mall. If I was a mall owner right now, I'd be very worried. If I owned a lot of retail stores or dependent on tourism for my revenue, I'd be very worried. I think that. We have to look at COVID as a, as a generational event. If you ask people who lived through great wars or the Great Depression, it was an event that permanently adjusted their mindset. And it's very hard to know what that mindset adjustment is going to look like when we're still in the midst of a crisis. But it's safe to assume that some kind of permanent shift is likely and that people might actually reestablish priorities and maybe in a positive way. And from a technological perspective, this, form, this, this trend of digital transformation is just going to be cemented and all sorts of firms are going to move up what we call a technology adoption curve. And, and firms with cash, and with tech firms in particular, because their stocks have been doing so well in the midst of this crisis, are going to essentially be able to look at the economy and, and choose which kind of distressed assets are interesting to them or not. Classic point in case is Amazon negotiating with Simons, the largest mall owner in the United States, about converting old malls into distribution centers. From a legal perspective, perhaps managing COVID effectively is going to require contact, contact tracing. And indeed, the countries that have done really well had mandatory apps that you had to download and install in case you were ever proximate to someone who was sick. And so now suddenly will COVID accelerate changing cultural norms around privacy and associated legal norms around privacy? And environmentally, this is one of the hardest things because while COVID has destroyed our economy, we've seen 15 to 20 percent declines depending on where you are, carbon emissions are only on track to go down 8 percent. So it's actually been some of the most expensive form of CO2 reductions ever. However, certain segments of the economy, air travel, cruising, a lot of commuting, may not ever recover to previous levels with all sorts of associated benefits. So we can kind of go to Talib and his black swan notion of like things come out of nowhere and they change everything. And are there black swans that are sort of transformative and, you know, not necessarily in a positive way, but something comes along and, and shocks us and changes the status quo and shifts a baseline. But then there's gray swans, which uh, we should have anticipated. And COVID was clearly one of those things, given how much we knew about SARS viruses in general and the likelihood that our modern globalized world is very poorly suited to cope with a pandemic. Nonetheless, it's happened. It was a gray swan. It's changed everything. But John Elkington, who is a, who's sort of like a thought leader in the space of 
of uh, corporate sustainability. He was the guy who coined the phrase triple bottom line back in the 1980s. Uh, he's really uh, been around forever uh, in, in this space. He, coined, he recently released a bo book called Green Swans, where, look, maybe there's events that come along that force us to think about how we have more resilient and regenerative economies. Right? Maybe it's a response to a shock, to a trauma, to a crisis, is us actually taking enough time to reflect and reorient and re-gear our economies and our businesses and our lives in a way that actually make them more sustainable in balancing these things out. So another researcher that we can kind of tap into for some inspiration is a woman called Amy Webb. She's a quantitative futurist at New York University, and she offers something called a time cone. Right? So she says, look, to think that you know what the world's going to be like in two, five, or ten years is kind of silly. What you have to do is embed ambiguity and uncertainty into your model. So tactically, in the next one to two years, you have quite a bit of data, evidence, and certainty about what's going to happen, so you can make choices about you know, what you want to do and what you may not want to do. But the further uh, you, along you go in time frame, uh, and the less evidence and data and certainty you have, uh, the more you're either developing a strategy, a vision, or systems evolution. But what would be a sort of a fascinating thought experiment is to essentially look at this time cone and ask, did COVID compress it? Has a, are there systems level evolutions that we've been fighting for or advocating for or hoping for for a long time that are now suddenly going to be accelerated because so many of our sort of political, economic, and social foundations have been shook and are going to require rebuilding and reimagining in ways that perhaps seemed impossible even just 12 months ago? And so there's all sorts of evidence of this. Amy Webb in her, in her model says, look for weak signals from the future. The evidence of, of, of a way of doing things that's not yet widely accepted or adopted. Look for those weak signals and ask, could that weak signal be translated into something much stronger? And so COVID is like this amplifying effect, taking existing trends and accelerating them. It, it, it took the existing trend of education becoming more hybrid, more flexible, uh, more dynamic, more accessible to more people. And now suddenly we're actually learning how to do this online if we have to. And we're actually learning how to do it quite well. An existing trend in Vancouver was that we had extremely onerous liquor laws in British Columbia and in Vancouver in particular. It was really hard for restaurants to, to sell beer for takeout or for, uh, for patrons to drink beer on a patio or for people to even legally just have a drink with their family or friends in a park. And in this very short period of time, all of those sort of ideas have shifted and changed. Some places are now allowing you to get married on Zoom. You don't have to be physically present at a courthouse. What if you just don't want to go to a courthouse? You don't want to go to a church. You're just like you and your, your partner just want to get hitched. Officer of the court gets on Zoom. You say, we're committed to each other. Off you go. But Magnus Carlsen, he's the Norwegian grand uh, master of chess and uh, perhaps uh, the best chess player to have ever lived. He has a fascinating story because there was a chess tournament that was going on right before the COVID shutdown commenced. And that tournament played by classic chess rules, which is where everybody has a really long time to make their moves. And these games are slow and boring and frankly, quite predictable. And Magnus was a fan of what he would call like speed chess. He would say that we should give people a very short period of time to make a decision and play more games, a higher volume of faster games, because only in that larger volume, do you get to see the personality of a chess player? Do you get to see their creativity? Do you get to see some glimpse of how they think. So this chess tournament that was being played in order to decide who gets to challenge Magnus for his, his crown got canceled. No one could travel. The, the, the tournament was halfway through and everyone had to rush back home before travel bans were put in place. So what does Magnus do? Well, he takes this old, boring institution, this chess tournament, and he makes his own online speed chess tournament to crown who gets to compete against him. Uh, for, for the title of Grand Master. So this is like an, a, a, something just disrupting happening, and now chess will never be the same. Restaurants will never be the same. Education will never be the same. The way government uh, relies on, uh, uh, interacts with people and the role that we expect government to play in our lives will never be the same. Our expectations of companies and how they take care of our safety and our health and our well-being will never be the same. The expectations that employees have of their employers will never be the same. Right? Consumers and businesses and governments and society have all shown 
that and and this is this is frankly a, a remarkable source of optimism for me they've all shown that they can innovate that in the face of grand challenges we can adapt we are not just stuck and that is something that we should be encouraged by because there's an idea from political science called the Overton window. And this was used to describe all sorts of phenomena over time where ideas go from being completely unthinkable to desirable. And I'll be a little provocative in my selection of an example here, but if you go back long enough, a hundred years ago, it was unthinkable that we had allow women to vote. And we had to have protests and a suffragette movement and, and, and people willing to put their safety and well-being on the line and, and confront legal challenges just to fight for the, the right to vote. And so because of their energy and their activism, an unthinkable idea slowly moved towards the right, became radical, perhaps even acceptable, and then with sufficient pressure, desirable. And COVID-19 has essentially done this for all sorts of different ideas. Look to the next big government stimulus package that's going to come sometime in the fall. Look how quickly they've expanded employment insurance to cover contract workers and self-employed individuals, people who are a little more economically fragile. Look to how quickly different regions in the world are going to start piloting versions of a thing called universal basic income. Look how quickly the idea of working from home went from an annoyance to, hey, this isn't so bad. Maybe I need a hybrid work environment. Look how quickly people are going to suddenly start asking themselves, why do I need to live in a dense, expensive city when I could live so on the suburbs or a plane ride away or maybe a ferry ride and then just come into town a couple times a week or a couple times a month in order to have a meeting with my boss or my colleagues. The whole notion of work is suddenly going through a radical transformation. So to, to pull this all together in summary, everything is connected. COVID teaches that, climate change is teaching us that, sustainability is teaching us that, and it's worthwhile to care. It's worthwhile to acknowledge that our economic systems and therefore our businesses and our business models are embedded inside of social and planetary systems. So pretending that we can just balance these things may not actually be the right thing to do. What you might want to do as a business leader is ask yourself, am I in part of a stable society? Am I contributing towards a stable planet? Because that kind of stability is actually what's going to allow your business to thrive in the long run. COVID-19 is this perfect sort of communications lesson because it teaches us that, look, you, a risk comes along and it's a lot easier if you do something sooner rather than later. And hopefully we see some action in and around climate. I've seen a ton of attention uh, around green, green recovery. I've been talking to government officials and, and uh, about what that might actually look like. We've seen evidence that economic, social, political systems are actually capable of rapid change. We're not just, we don't have to accept the status quo. In fact, the status quo is the least likely option. It's change that is the new default. And COVID exemplified that by amplifying all these existing trends around excessive business travel, excessive commute times, uh, un, uh, cultures that were not tolerant of notions like working from home. And so doubling down on business as usual in the midst of all of this change is just not a smart strategy. Assuming that a V-shaped recovery is what's going to happen and we're going to go back to just making money the way we used to, I'm going to go back to doing the job exactly the way I used to, I don't think that's sensible. Right? We're going to have different recoveries, different forces, but in the midst of all of this transformation are these changes in uh, technology and consumer preferences and corporate culture that are not going to go back in the bottle even when the COVID crisis is over. And in general, there's this notion from economics that there's things called externalities and they can be positive or negative. I'll focus on negative and that a negative externality is unpriced good, right? So if your business relies on emitting something into the atmosphere or creating pollution or on cheap labor and the, the, the full price of that, that, that emission of that pollution is not adequately captured, you've created a negative externality and it's not captured in the price of what you do. And so we should be fighting that. We want to ensure that our businesses and our economies reflect the true cost of production because if we don't, the real cost down the line is actually much higher. So there you go. That was uh, under time. And uh, I'm happy to take as many questions as time allows. But also, if people want to connect with me on LinkedIn, uh, there's, my, uh, there's a link and also my LinkedIn ID as well. Please feel free to uh, shoot me an email if you have any questions on this or anything else. So I see uh, some hands up here. Uh, I'm happy to just call those folks out directly. Uh, and maybe uh, whoever's doing the IT side can handle the unmuting. Uh, Brandon, please go ahead. 
Yeah, Justin, um, thank you so much for for this lovely talk. Really exciting, really interesting. Um, I, I wanted to sort of ask a question about the sort of the three tiers of um, you know economics, uh, society, and then planetary perspectives, um, because there's clearly a trend going on that from the sector that I work in, that I see um, a, a belief that perhaps the planetary systems don't necessarily define the human species, and that you know, whether in five years or 10 years or before Elon Musk's death, we will be an interplanetary species. Um, and so I, I see this sort of narrative of don't let that be our limit. And I was wondering if you could sort of weave that in and talk about how that impacts some of the themes that you discussed in this talk. Yeah, I mean, in a, in a way, what you're asking me to do is like, which sci-fi dystopia do I believe in? Right. Is it <laughs> is it Elysium? Is it uh, Terminator 2? Like, you, you know what I mean? I mean? I'm not trying to be crass, but like science fiction is how we most effectively actually explore some of these difficult questions. And I would say that like the notion of that technology will solve everything. So let's not worry about planetary systems is hubris. I think that planetary systems are so enormously complex and we rely so immensely on them for providing many of the things which are most important to us that they, they are in many regards, like the cheapest source of carbon storage is a tree. And yet humans, because we love technology so much, we're so in love with it, we have to invent some solution that involves pulling it out of the air using complicated mechanical machinery and chemical processes, right? So I think that in order to actually meet the needs of not just a few million people or perhaps uh, just the elite in the Western world, but in order to meet the needs of nine and a half, 10 and a half billion people who are alive by the end of the century, we have no choice but to respect planetary systems because even in Elon's plan to put people on Mars, that's a long-term bet so that the spark of human consciousness is not just isolated to one planet or another in case of some cataclysmic event. However, that doesn't mean that we should be morally okay with the fact that maybe a few people in a few cities will have enough technology to clean their air and feed themselves and condemn the rest of humanity to permanently degraded natural systems. So that would be my, my response to your colleagues who are, uh, I mean, I appreciate their provocations and those are conversations that I have as well, but uh, yeah. I, I truly believe in, in the importance of respecting planetary systems. So, so it almost sounds like you see a risk um, that, that these sort of narratives might lead to inaction or to inopportune decisions coming in the future because of that, um, yeah. you know, okay. Our success in solving previous problems could generate a sense of complacency. And just because we've solved every other problem we've had confronted in the past doesn't suggest that we are going to solve all the ones in the future, right? That, that shouldn't be an indicator uh, from my perspective. So, yeah. Uh, other questions. I see a few in uh, the Q&A here uh, from Neil Irwin. Hi, Justin. Do you see the increasingly apparent contradiction between relocalization and globalization manifesting itself more clearly? Absolutely. Like, I think the, uh, the what we're actually seeing is... Uh, we're not seeing a process of deglobalization. I think we're seeing going to see an emergence of more regional trading blocks where the United States uh, has a trading network, that China has a trading network, and the EU has a trading network. And that those sorts of concentrations of power and people figure out who they're aligned with. And so pure, unadulterated 1990 to 2010 globalization where it was just a constant race to the bottom for the lowest cost operating environment. We continue to sign trade, sign trade agreements that bring down trade barriers. We just continue to specialize and specialize and specialize. I think that is, those are ideas that are going to be fundamentally tested and are in the midst of being tested right now. So yeah, I don't know if it's a contradiction. It's just an evolution because if you, if you go um, historically, if you go back to uh, the early 1900s, right before the outbreak of the First World War, rates of, if you measured global trade relative to GDP, it was almost as high as the peak of globalization. So we've had intensely globalized economies before, and then that process breaks down, and then it takes time to rebuild itself again. So that would be my, uh, my answer to, ne uh, to uh, Neil. Ivy, uh, Asked, hi, Justin, thank you for the lecture. Based on your research and opinion, is working remotely going to be a sustainable option for employers and employees? Well, sustainable uh, in what way? So environmentally, perhaps. I mean, if you were walking down the street to work, that's one thing. If you were driving 100 kilometers each way, that's another. Uh, sustainable socially. 
Uh, if you're sitting alone in your apartment going absolutely bonkers and you're desperate for the company of your colleagues and friends, uh, working from home, it may not actually be uh, the best choice for you and your mental health. So I, I think that at the moment we're dealing with a binary, we're dealing with uh, either we're all in the office or we're all working from home. I think the future involves a hybrid model where we have flexible working spaces, flexible work contracts, more flexible cultures, because there's a certain level of creativity and engagement uh, between employees and peers that you just can't replicate online. And we're, people are gonna be hungry for that. However, they're gonna remain uh, jealous of the flexibility that COVID has provided, working from home has provided. So I don't think we're gonna just walk away from that. So that's a great question. Thank you very much. much. Uh, Rajuta asks, uh, situations like COVID are globally connected. However, all countries still try to produce their bare necessities. How would global standards for sustainability be implemented? I mean, I, so again, I think you're dealing with a bit of a binary because I don't think all countries are going to try and produce everything. I think that they're just going to be a little more uh, risk adverse. I think they're going to have more... Uh, they're going to have more domestic manufacturing capacity or the ability to spin that capacity up. I think they're going to have stronger direct relationships with their trading partners as opposed to fully anonymized tra trading relationships that makes them a little more sensitive to shocks like this. Uh, I think that a lot of countries are going to realize that in responding to COVID, they might actually build up their own manufacturing capacities as a way to emerge out of the economic crisis and uh, go forward in that regard. I think that global standard, like standard sustainability, I'm not sure what kind of standards you're referring to, like financial standards, uh, sustainable development goals. There's a lot of different ones uh, that, that uh, we could be talking about. But in general, I think it does change things. So I'm not sure that's a perfect answer to your question, but I appreciate it nonetheless. Uh, Edmund Wong is asking, do you think we'll see a drop in standard of living if our economies aren't going to be as specialized in the future? Well, so here's the interesting thing is that I think we have to be very precise in our terminology. Standard of living, oftentimes, I think we're kind of lazy in how we measure it and that we may measure it purely based off of income, right? GDP per capita or someone's own income or income potential. And a lot of evidence is emerging that like as you make more and more income, you don't become happier. So I actually what we hope, hope to see is that we see COVID teaching us that rather than just prioritize standard of living, we actually start prioritizing well-being. Are you happy should be the first question. And yes, your basic needs of, of food and safety and shelter and belonging and all those Maslowian needs, of, uh, needs, those do have to be met. But standard of living, I think what we need is a more expansive definition of that so that we can measure well-being. Uh, however, if we, if we do, I mean, I, I don't want to sort of throw globalization under the bus, right? There are an enormous benefits to it uh, because it's kind of tempting to see it simply as a phenomenon of trading goods and exchanging goods. But globalization is also an exchange of services, an exchange of ideas, an exchange of human capital. And that is the kind of thing that I hope sustains. And we may just see that goods uh, and where they come from and how they're manufactured, we could see some changes there. Uh, but I don't think that it's the decline in, 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 in uh, 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 a specialization that's going to reduce uh, standard of living. I think what it is is that if we don't deal with these planetary problems uh, that we're confronting, that we're going to see a reduction in standard of living. So, uh, good question. Thank you, Edmund. Uh, Jose asks the capitalism model, uh, model the way we know it, is it sustainable or will COVID uh, reshape it? So, uh, capitalism is the free exchange of uh, 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 free markets and the exchange of goods and services between people in those markets in order to find the most efficient outcomes. I think what's happening is that capitalism is evolving its definition of efficiency and the things that it has to price. And so I return back to that notion of externalities where there's unpriced externalities like carbon emissions or unpriced priced externalities like uh, biodiversity loss associated with deforestation, which can often trigger zootropic uh, movement of disease from one community to another. Like those are things that are unpriced for and capitalism has to do a better job of pricing for those things. I think that capitalism may have, uh, you know, if you, if you go back to Milton Friedman and his definition of, of, of the social responsibility of a firm is to maximize profits for shareholders. That's what everyone thinks of as business, that capitalism is just the most important thing, make his profit maximized, go, 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 go. Everyone forgets the second sentence of his quote, which is, as long as it does so within the rules of the game. And the rules of the game are what government says can and cannot happen. And COVID is going to encourage uh, governments to be a little more 
uh, proactive in how they manage sustainability challenges because if they take the back seat like they have for the last 20 years, something like this kind of pops up and the costs are extremely high. So that's, that's a great question and one that we could go on uh, for a very long time. And then Bakar asks, uh, with globalization going down, which parts of it are, parts of it are not, so I'm not sure I 100% accept the premise, uh, but do you think in the next five to 10 years, might, Earth might recover some of the damage done to it? So I don't want to speculate because I think the next five to 10 years, uh, there's, our, we don't know if like carbon emissions are going to actually go down for very long. They could bounce back very quickly. Uh, what I will say is COVID shows us that systems, planetary systems can bounce back very quickly. So I think that is a, a sign of hope right there. Anyways, I think I'm supposed to be done, right? Am I over? Yeah, good timing, Justin. So Perfect. it was exactly 45 minutes. Um, thank you so much for this um, really amazing, like thought provoking lecture and for answering all those questions. Um, like everyone in the um, attending, please give a big virtual round of applause to Justin for joining us today and sharing his thoughts on this provocative topic. Um, Justin, if you're around, feel free to continue answering some questions in the chat box, but we're going to move on now um, to our uh, virtual alumni panel. So I'd like to ask um, our alumni um, to please uh, turn on your um, video and voice feeds and um, we'll start with the, um, the alumni panel. Uh, let's see, we have everyone here. Great. All right, I think everyone is uh, here. So thank you everyone for, um, for joining me today. So um, just to start off the panel, could uh, maybe we do a round of introductions. Can you tell us who you are, um, what your undergraduate major was and what you were doing before the um, MBA program and then what you're, um, what you're doing now? Um, maybe uh, Aaron, you can start. All right, hey Vivian. Hey everyone, um, my name is Aaron Kaiway. I'm uh, originally my uh, bachelor's is in eng electronics engineering from SFU. Um, I graduated from the part-time MBA program in 2015. Uh, and before that I was at, uh, I was basically a senior engineer at Intel Corporation. And since then I've stayed with Intel and now I'm uh, managing a, a global engineering team for Intel. So um, it, it, the MBA has really helped uh, help propel me along that path. But uh, thank you for having me today. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing your thoughts today. Um, how about Kevin? You go next. Hi. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Great. Hi. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity and uh, pleasure meeting you all virtually. Kevin Chang and I graduated from the MBA program in 2013. Uh, prior to the MBA program, I, my background, education background was in DCOM, I, which I also did at UBC. So, uh, so it was a great thing. Um, after my DCOM, I joined consulting, mostly in consulting with Ernst & Young, I kept German, Ernst & Young and then Ernst & Young. So I've uh, been around doing consulting for a while, mostly in the procurement workspace, uh, procurement consulting. Uh, after my MBA, I uh, also went back to EY, Ernst & Young EY. I spent uh, uh, another two years in Vancouver and then I moved to London, UK, uh, 2016. I actually just came back uh, relatively recently in February this year with my family um, as, I had a, as I had a young one. So, so time to come back home for some free babysitting, I always say. And then now I am with uh, SAP. Uh, for one of the enterprise software, which is called Ariba, which is the central procurement software. And I am a senior uh, director in the solution management group, looking after the particular product side of the Ariba, uh, working with the customers to make sure we're innovating the products and bringing new features to, 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 the, to the industry. Fantastic. Thank you, Kevin. Um, and welcome back to Vancouver. Um, Catherine, why don't we um, go with you? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Catherine Salinas. Um, I graduated in 2016 from the part time program. Slightly different structure, I think, from PMEA, but um, still like very, very close uh, to it. Um, at the time uh, that I enrolled, I was uh, I'd been in a working in an IT role. Um, my undergrad is in computer science and information systems. So I didn't really have much of the business background and I was kind of stuck. I was working for um, 
a large uh, financial company um, in a kind of, like as Vivian mentioned at the start, kind of an operational role, and I was stuck and wanted to kind of try to move out. Um, so during the course of the MBA, I did um, get uh, another position um, with a, a, a different company. I actually changed a couple of times and then just um, after MBA um, landed my current role, which is with the city of Vancouver in the technology department, um, doing um, uh, infrastructure and service management. So. Wonderful. Thanks, Catherine. Um, Nurez, why don't you go next? Sure. Thanks, Vivian. Hi, everyone. It's uh, nice to meet. My name is Nurez. I graduated from the UBC MBA program in 2013, uh, prior to graduation. I was working as an engineer, uh, doing some design work. Uh, my undergrad was in engineering, and then I moved into finance uh, following the MBA. Uh, during the starter MBA, the careers office uh, connected me with mentors at consulting firms and investment banks and government, and so on in Vancouver and Toronto. So I ended up selecting a mentor at Deloitte uh, because consulting uh, had interested me at the time. So before graduation, UBC then helped me approach my mentor uh, for a position at Deloitte. And subsequently I was offered a role and I joined the firm as a senior associate during the final, final months of classes just before the final exams. Um, and then in 2016, uh, I was headhunted by a Deloitte client uh, called Lee Fisher uh, on Bay Street in Toronto. Uh, to join the finance and transactions team uh, to work on a, on a rail deal. So the offer was pretty good. So I departed Vancouver uh, in 2016 and I moved to Toronto and have been here ever since. Uh, things have moved on a little since then. I'm now currently associate director at the same firm. I work with clients in the US, Canada and the Middle East, mostly on uh, consulting and advisory engagements. Uh, most of our clients include uh, investment banks, uh, pension funds, government investors, and others on uh, infrastructure deals. Great, thanks so much, Nerez. Oh, I'd like to remind the attendees, um, if you'd like to ask our alumni panel a question, feel free to queue up those questions in the Q&A chat box, or also use the raise hand feature so you can ask the question directly using the voice feed. Um, so continuing on, uh, Felicia, what we um, go with you, tell us your story. Thanks, Vivian. Uh, so Felicia Granger, uh, my undergrad was in marketing and communications, um, so I did a BBA, uh, worked for many, many years in global marketing and communications, um, reached kind of my learning curve and was looking for something more. Um, so I did actually transition after the MBA um, into healthcare, which uh, I do have a passion for kind of transformation and uh, some, you know, helping to kind of solve some of the toughest problems. Um, so I do have a role now with Vancouver Coastal Health as a manager of uh, program development for both change as well as our recognition programs, um, supporting our staff of over 14,000. So, um, and I would just add to that for the last uh, six months, obviously, uh, really, you know, being in the throes of uh, a global pandemic and working in healthcare. So that has brought uh, a lot of really amazing kind of challenges as well as silver lining. So happy to be here. Thanks so much, Felicia. And Mike, um, tell us your story. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Mike Solly. Uh, thanks a lot for, uh, for asking me to come and speak. Um, I have a, a little bit of a kind of backwards story. So I was a graduate uh, in 2018. Prior to joining the MBA, I was actually a small business owner for about seven and a half years. Um, my background is actually in economics, and uh, I was one of those uh, lucky few that managed to graduate um, a couple of weeks after the last Great Recession. So needless to say, a career in finance didn't work out at that time. Um, so I went off and started a construction business actually with a couple of friends of mine. Uh, we ran it for a long time. I was always very interested in sort of following up on my original career aspirations. So um, joined uh, the part-time MBA, which was the, the precursor to the PMBA. A little bit different, but uh, you know a lot of similarities there. Um, luckily, through Solder, great opportunities to make some connections. I met some folks at RBC. And I've been working at RBC um, since about 2017. So I joined halfway through the program. Uh, I work in commercial banking. I've held 
um, a couple of different roles within uh, commercial banking now, uh, both in the um, uh, client management side as well as uh, on our analytical team where I'm now a, um, a senior credit analyst. So uh, it's been uh, definitely um, a lot of changes for me. Um, and, uh, you know, the program has been a really great springboard into, uh, into following up on some of those uh, career dreams that I had for a long time. Great. Thanks for sharing, Mike. And it is quite an interesting story of yours, because I think of all the panels, you had quite a dramatic um, transition from being a small business owner and also having that ubiquitous, like, experience that I think a lot of people right now, if they're just coming out of school or they're early in their career, is that recession, like you, you started your career into a recession. So um, can you tell us a little bit about how that, how that transition worked for you? Because it was a pretty dramatic transition to being a small business owner and then suddenly landing in finance after you graduated. Sure. I mean, it was definitely a huge switch. And, and you know, some of the folks at the time, um, you know, within my current organization had asked me the same thing. I, I remember one of our very senior leaders, um, you know, the first time that we met had asked me, he said, Mike, uh, you know, you're going from being your own boss, uh, where you can sort of choose what you want to do every day to one of the most structured environments you can possibly imagine uh, within the banking industry in Canada. Uh, you know, we're, we're very regulated. And this isn't going to be anything like you've been used to. And uh, so he asked me the same question, you know, are you going to be able to make that switch? And um, yeah, it was, you know, a lot of things were very different at the same time. I feel, you know, within the role in the organization that I'm a part of, a lot of these, uh, a lot of these uh, roles are actually very entrepreneurial too. There's a lot of skills that you learn there that you can really adapt into uh, your new roles. And so, you know, looking at that in an MBA uh, framework as well, you're picking up a lot of the, uh, the real base level skills that you can then add to what you have already, modify them a little bit, and, and parlay that into a new career. Um, it has been, you know, it definitely has been a big switch for me. Um, the MBA certainly gave me the platform that I needed to make that switch, but a lot of it is, um, I think a lot of it is a mental adjustment. And, uh, you know, if, if I was going to tie it back to school again, I would say a program like this, um, you know, particularly in, in a part time capacity, I think is really about pushing your boundaries, um, pushing what you thought you were capable of or what you maybe didn't know you were capable of. And uh, you come out a very resilient person who's who's ready for change. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for me, somebody who felt for the, you know, for the first time in many years that I could go in multiple different directions. You know, it wasn't just a single trajectory coming out of it. You're looking at all sorts of different opportunities across the board. And, and I was looking at a couple of consulting um, related opportunities as well. So um, broad platform uh, through school really helped me with that transition. And, and, and I think that, you know, if, if people are looking to make a switch or make a pivot, as well as staying with you know within their current organization or the current line of business, um, you know that that real broad base and ability to sort of uh, push yourself to new boundaries is is, is really a, a huge win, and that's something you'll pick up from a program like this. Thank you so much, Mike, for sharing that. Um, really interesting. I'm because I remember meeting you when you're first starting on the journey, and when you told me you wanted to make the switch to finance, I'm like, wow, that's like quite a big switch and it was really amazing to actually see you make that change. So fantastic story and thank you for sharing it. Um, great, so I'd like to pose a question to all of the panelists, like just talking about boundaries. And I think, um, you know, I think a lot of the, the commonality that I hear from all students, whether they are career promoters within the same company or they make dramatic shifts in their career is how the program kind of redefine the upper limits <laughs> of what they can do in terms of boundaries. So I'd like to pose a question to all the panelists. Um, how did the program challenge you to change and like kind of expand the boundaries of what you thought you could do? So it's a pretty broad question, so feel free to answer any way you like. <laughs> Maybe I can get started on this. Yeah. Again, that's okay. <clears throat> so I think from this two points, two points, the transformation comes for me or for most people would be the education, right? I think that's the core, that, that's what you would expect after you spend two years, you're gonna pick up some new skills, things that you didn't know how to do before, uh, things that you were interested in doing before, now you learn, learned how to do it properly, that's great. Um, so that's expected. I think what's worth for me to share is more from a risk-taking perspective. 
I think it really um, encourages me and 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 foster the the mindset that taking risk is not a bad thing at all. In fact, that's how most people grow out, grow and become more bigger, so to say. So so taking that risk and finding that right opportunity to take that risk. So don't be afraid to take that risk. It, it, it really broadens that. And I would encourage people who are in the MBA program to, to embrace that because in the real world, you're just going to be uh, given or uh, opportunities will stumble upon you and you will need to make that call. Do I want to take it? Comfort zone is probably not. I'm pretty okay with where I am. I'm happy with where I am. Why would I want to do something new? Um, so, so, so get ready for that. And, and, the, and the program sort of is my a bit more like a first step to say, it's okay. This is what you're expected to be doing. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Really strong um, words there. I mean, nothing highlights that more than this ready or not global pandemic and everything <laughs> changes. So having that kind of mindset of just diving in and, and tackling problems is something really valuable to take out of it. So thanks for sharing that, Kevin. Anybody else want to talk about like how the program kind of reworked their boundaries of? I think, um, so Vivian, maybe I'll, I'll take a stab at this. Um, yeah. I would echo Kevin's comments. He's absolutely right. Um, I think the program, you know, the, the academic side is the core. And I think one of the, 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 um, the good things about the program was really the, the way it forces you to step out of your comfort zone and think outside of the box. Um, you know, there were many case studies where, um, you know, we were involved in quite a bit of teamwork and, you know, just sort of um, studying it and also um, collaborating with others, working in teams and understanding other people's perspectives. So, you know, there were times where, you know, we'd be in class doing work and, um, you know, we'd have a view and we thought our view was right or our perspective was correct. And somebody across the table in the team would present a very different perspective. And, and that's really, um, and then sort of being able to, you know, absorb that, understand that really reflects what goes on in the real world, um, especially as I travel across the U.S. and Canada um, on consulting and advisory engagements. What I find is really that what we did in class in our groups really um, has helped me sort of uh, take that to the boardroom and uh, into into meetings and 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 sort of work in teams more effectively. Yeah, that's a really good point to bring up, Nerez, just working in really different groups. And, you know, not everybody's like, it's like a group full of like really A-type people, whether you're introverted or extroverted. So like learning how to work with each other is like part of the journey as well. And it really translates into like all the different types of people you're gonna meet as you go through your journey. So that's a really good point. Aaron, why don't you go next? Sure. So thinking back of my experience, I think the the real shift that, that I got out of the program was going from a mindset of really what what can I can I achieve, as in what is possible for me to achieve personally and looking at all those boundaries, to going to a mindset of what do we uh, want to achieve? So, so do, going from a can perspective to a want perspective and really pulling out some, some really changes in attitudes really based upon things like making decisions under massive uncertainties, like plotting out scenarios that you want to have, have occur and then adapting when those things don't turn out to be true and then just plotting another path towards what you ultimately want to achieve. Um, and then, then focusing on those outcomes in, in your decision making. Um, I think those were probably, you know, two of the key things that I pulled from the program, which helped me pull through some, some personal boundaries, which um, were plaguing me. Like um, I work at a company of a uh, hundred and ten thousand people with a lot of politics, and uh, the MBA helped reframe my restrictions into more possibilities. That's excellent. So just re reframing the way you think and overcoming the like kind of barriers you put on yourself that, you know, maybe you didn't even know were there until you were pushed to go beyond that is, is a really good one to share as well. Thank you, Erin. Mm -hmm. Catherine, you want to go next? Um, sure. Yeah, I kind of agree with uh, everyone so far. And also just to add on to uh, Nerez's comments about your classmates, it's probably one of the few times where you'll be working on business problems with someone who's 
works, you know, in a biological field, who's an architect, who's, um, you know, like a lawyer. Um, you have so many different people in your groups and it just really gives you a totally different perspective that with my world in IT, pretty much everyone's kind of coming from the same <laughs> like academic background or experience background. So definitely take advantage of that. Um, and then the thing, um, I guess a little bit similar to what Aaron was mentioning just before is uh, um, I find like, you know, sometimes you go into decisions and it's, it's not as, I won't say it's not as stressful, but you can feel better equipped to deal with it sometimes. And there's things that I think in previous jobs, I probably would have been wanting just to curl up in a ball and cry in the corner. And you just kind of, you're able to power through and you're not really so um, um, worried because you feel like you've got some tools to fall back. And, you know, there's times every once in a while, I, I go back and look at notes from a particular course or something just to, because I, I know I've done it. So it's kind of nice to be able to go back and refer to something. So it gives a good, I think, comfort. That's great. I love that it builds resiliency. So like, whereas before you would curl up into a ball, like the next, like now you'd like actually go and solve the problem because you've been pushed to, to solve mm -hmm. that kind of problem before. That's great. And Felicia, what do you have to share for that? Yeah, I would, uh, you know, just uh, obviously echo kind of what people are saying. I would also maybe add to that, just from a people standpoint, um, certainly our classmates, also help us to kind of expand our own thinking, um, even from a career standpoint. So I think that was a piece for sure that actually many of us um, within our cohort have kind of carried forward and we're, we still kind of act as, you know, many career kind of advisors to each other in terms of reframing and helping each other to kind of see what the possibilities could be, um, even if we can't see it for ourselves. And then the second piece that kind of came up for me, just as, as Catherine was talking, um, I, you know, I do think this whole PMBA exercise is certainly one of capacity building. Um, you don't know what you can, what you can handle and what you can manage and what you can lead until you do it, until somebody's actually, you know, picking up the phone and asking you to start to do something that you maybe have never tried before. Um, and I would say for me, you know, what, what this has also kind of, I guess, supported me to do is, um, is, you know, more easily and more comfortably kind of rise to that and, uh, and sort of, you know, even at times, uh, like throw caution to the wind and take on some really tough challenges. So. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks for sharing that. Definitely that point about like the closeness of the cohort and how you help each other is really apparent in like your cohort and many other cohorts that I've seen. Um, just that support network that comes from all different industries, you probably would have never met each other had it not been for a program like this. And now suddenly you have all these industry insights into like all these different industries, but you also have like kind of friends for life. Like I know you guys are still doing your book clubs and still doing like trips together. Even so. through COVID. <laughs> somehow <laughs> we're, we're like, you know we're trying to meet at parks we're yeah. doing zoom we're yeah we're trying to be uh, as resilient as possible as uh, as people as well so yeah and it's just something one of your cohort members ryan smith had told me is like you guys are like your own little swat team that like go in and like solve problems when you're in the the pm in the mba program and then like yeah it's just it's, it's a really good network to have um, because it's a really close network, not, not just for like superficial advice. These are like deep advice and, and help that you wouldn't have gotten unless you'd gone through a program like this together. So, um, so thanks for sharing that, that insight. Um, so we have a, qu a couple of questions in the chat box. Um, one is towards um, Nurez. Um, it's from Hassan um, and he's asking how much of your success in transitioning from a technical background to an investment banking slash transaction background do you attribute to the MBA? <laughs> that's a really good question. Yeah, that's, um, let's just put it this way. Even today, um, seven years after the MBA, I still pull out my class notes uh, from something that I learned in class. Um, so Sometimes, you know, um, we have to build financial models, do financial analysis. And because there's just so much theory out there, there's so much math in the work. Um, I actually have the textbooks from the MBA right here in my condo in Toronto. Um, I flew, flew, flew them over from Vancouver uh, because uh, they were so important. So um, I would say that um, the, you know, the, um, but it goes back to the point Kevin was making earlier, you know, um, the core is the education, 
the education is good. Uh, the um, sort of like the classes, you know, so, you know, focusing on the assignments. Uh, because I specialize in finance, uh, there's a lot of there was a lot of math, there was a lot of analysis, uh, a lot of data analysis. So I would say till this day, um, yeah, the a lot of what I did on the MBA is still I still carry with me today yeah, on the job. Excellent. Thanks for sharing that, Nuris. Um, now we have another question um, from Daniel, and this one's for Kevin. Um, how do you benefit from the MBA experience or the part-time MBA experience, having gone through a similar academic curriculum during your BCom education? So this is that question regarding, like, you know, what's the benefit of an MBA once you have done a BCom? No, no, it's a, it's a good question too. Um, good challenging question. So I came up to that same question myself when I was going through the program. And at the time when we did, when I did it in 2013 and the rest was part of my cohort too, um, we, I, I, we were still able to choose um, the courses that we want. Um, and so I did my BCom in supply chain and uh, IT or, or MIS. So naturally I wasn't gonna repeat that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't repeat it from a core learning perspective or from the risk taking perspective that I just mentioned. So I chose something specifically different. I chose the strategy uh, work stream and also the finance work stream. That allows me to round out what I already have experience in work-wise and education-wise, supply chain and IT, to now something I've always been interested in doing, for example, finance valuation. Uh, love doing those kind of stuff, the model building stuff, Nures, right? <laughs> so that, 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 that's, that's exactly what I did. And I purposely picked something that I didn't do when I was in the BCom. Um, so so that's, that's how I made, made it work and make sense for me. Great. Thanks for sharing that, Kevin. So yeah, I've heard this from many other BCom students that this is not a repeat of your BCom. Like in your BCom, you're like, you know, 17, 18 years old when you start it. So you're not thinking in like an enterprise level, a leadership level. So the MBA can take it up another notch when you're starting to look at things. You've got some experience under your belt and now you're taking a very strategic education and you can pick and choose on the areas that you want to enhance, right? Um, and then and help you move into those more strategy and, and leadership roles. So that's a great question. Thank you for asking that. Um, so now I want to pose a question to kind of everyone on the panel again, um, just a broad question in terms of how did you find the career support when you were um, in the program? Like what did you particularly in your uh, cases utilize to help you move ahead in the different types of career plans you each had from the, from the MBA? Um, I can start with this one because I, uh, I did get headhunted partway through the, the MBA program one year in. Um, and but prior to that, just to go back before that, um, we uh, worked with Maria in my class and just like really fantastic, can't say enough good things uh, about, uh, about Maria. Um, but there's so many structured parts through the program. It might be slightly different in the P, uh, PMBA now, but we had multiple meetings to kind of understand where we might want to go, um, what type of companies we'd look at, what might be a good fit for us um, or not a good fit which was really good, um, had a few um, informational um, interviews as well. Uh, but when I actually um, did go to a couple of workshops on updating LinkedIn, um, updating your resume, and they turned out to be really helpful. So I did actually get noticed through uh, LinkedIn, um, I think about eight or nine months into the program and went through a pretty rigorous um, interview process. It was seven interviews with a, uh, one of the large American uh, tech firms. And um, like, it was really great to have Maria and other people from the career center just to help guide us along the way when I wasn't sure about how to um, respond back in a certain way or if I had questions that I might wanna be careful about, you know, like how do I answer this question? So it was fantastic. And then just to kind of give a, a real, you know, um, like I guess quantifiable benefit, um, when I met with my uh, hiring manager for the first time during those interview processes, the first thing he said was, that my resume was just like so fantastic because he was able to quickly look at it and see what he needed to see and understand what I was about. And, you know, again, that I really have to attribute to um, Mario and the Career Center because I don't think my previous resume would have been, uh, you know, uh, so well laid out. So I think that was fantastic. Great, thanks for sharing, Catherine. Um, anybody else want to talk about their experience utilizing the services of the Career Center and uh, what, 
what that contributed to their journey? Um, maybe I can add, Vivian, uh, just add to Catherine's comments um, regarding Maria. So Maria had uh, helped me, as I mentioned earlier, find a mentor. Um, there were a few offers. Uh, there were a few firms. Um, there were some banks, uh, consulting firms, some government folks. And, um, and then I picked a mentor at Deloitte, and it was the Deloitte mentor that actually helped me eventually then uh, secure a position at Deloitte. Um, and, and then following that, I was then able to move to Toronto. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I found that the mentor, um, having a mentor really made that difference. Yeah. And, and the careers office uh, through Maria was really effective in being able to, um, being able to connect us with mentors uh, because otherwise, you know, we're just applying for jobs against hundreds of thousands of other applicants and this sort of the mentorship program gave us a leg in and 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 also the some of the contacts the professors had also provided us uh, some leverage uh, locally and access to some key folks within uh, firms within vancouver and, and across canada which is good yeah wonderful thanks for sharing that Nerez. yeah the warm connections that the career center can facilitate can be quite transforming um, transformative, as you can see from the case of Nurez. So that's something that they do strive to, um, that they do try to make those connections that can either result in really good career insights, but also certain, certain opportunities as well, which is fantastic. Um, Felicia, I see you're unmuted, so I'm going to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just going to echo, Maria is amazing. Um, I, I can't say enough about the support that you know, it sounds like she has provided not just to our cohort, um, but many, many cohorts over the years. Um, certainly, I actually, I actually still email her every now and then if, you know, as a sounding board or um, to be able to connect, um, you know, even when there are opportunities that may come up, um, e even now. So I would say I, I can't say enough about that kind of a support. Um, I would also say too, just from a, from a cohort perspective, I think, you know, you can't underestimate the connections that you make kind of within, within your cohorts and kind of um, as colleagues. Uh, that's actually one of, one of the ways that I was actually drawn to healthcare was somebody in my cohort um, was currently working at a project that sounded super interesting. And it happened that, you know, they were looking for great people. And so <laughs> um, I would also say too, just, you know, that I guess that network of holistic kind of career support um, both from the Career Center, I also took advantage of the mentorship program, um, had, a, had an amazing mentor who was actually from SAP um, in, a, in a global capacity as a VP, and I would say some of the feedback that I was given was, um, was so helpful to, you know, helping to advance my career uh, very quickly, too. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for sharing that, Felicia. So, um, yeah, definitely like use your own classmates as well for those opportunities. So in Felicia's case, it resulted in a pretty dramatic change, which is, which is quite amazing. So um, anybody else want to weigh in on like what their experiences are with, with the um, Career Center? Otherwise, can uh, Mike, you're unmuted. Did you want to share? I, I couldn't possibly leave um, this question <laughs> without, of course, mentioning somebody who's been mentioned, I believe, four times already now. <laughs> um, you know, the, the fact of the matter is one of the most amazing resources that uh, you will find um, within this program is the Career Center, and um, you're very lucky to get to work with Maria Harmer. Um, I made one of the smartest choices of my career, uh, having a discussion with her very early on in my MBA journey. I think it was one or two weeks after um, we got started. In the very first opening I could, I sat down with her and had an honest chat, and it has made all the change. Um, me and what I wanted to do and I, I so I never miss a, a moment to to thank her for you know her and, and everything that her team has done at the same time I think a big piece of this too is you know um, most everybody here is is sort of you know in a more mature stage of, of life or you know we're, we're past uh, being undergrads and it's really great to have a frank and honest conversation with somebody about um, what they truly think you know the, you know, the best options are, the best directions to go in, the types of things that you would be a really good fit for. And you can share with them too, you know, the types of things that you're interested in. Um, you know, there's not always the, the perfect uh, situation out there for everybody, but 
uh, you may find that one role or an introduction to someone may lead you to that, you know, that end role that, that you're really looking for. So um, I can't say enough about the Career Center and about Mario's work. And, and you know, to, to add to that too, I think, um, be honest, follow up is alumni. Um, you will get introduced to a bunch of alumni and the alumni network is really another piece that's gonna help you propel that career forward. Um, you know, I was introduced to several alumni that work within my organization. Uh, they were all very giving of their time. You know, we sat down, we had a couple of coffees and the next thing you know, you're being introduced to a hiring manager or people who are making those types of decisions. So, you know, the Career Center can really um, take the time to make those connections. Um, talk to alumni, reach out to people that are within the organizations that you might be interested in, mm -hmm. or set you up with a mentor. Um, so I know I, I still try to keep in, in regular contact as much as I can, um, and, uh, and I love to give my time back um, you know, to meeting um, new people because that was what was done for me. So it, it's a real um, circular approach. And uh, so I, I, again, my, my entire journey has been changed um, incredibly by uh, the Career Center. So uh, I, I would say uh, this is one of the biggest resources that this program can bring and, and definitely um, you know, is a huge reason why somebody would consider a program like this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like I always hear the the you know the praise of Maria. Like she is an amazing individual, and you everyone who joins the program who's been part of the program, they have nothing but amazing things to say about her. I can tell you that she has a, a mind like a Rolodex because she remembers all of you and like little details about you too. So really, um, a remarkable um, asset um, to the PMBA program. Now we do have a few questions queued up, so I want to have the chance to ask them. Um, so we have a question from Timothy, um, just kind of posing to all the panelists. Did you have a clear idea of what you wanted from the um, MBA program when you started? Um, did you have a, a strong interest in the curriculum um, or the networking or the critical thinking development? Um, and uh, were you, if you didn't have a clear idea, were you able to maximize the benefit of the program without having a clear picture kind of going into the program. So anyone can take a stab at this one. It's kind of multi-part. Um, I'll just jump in quickly again. Yeah. Um, I was a good example of someone that, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, I needed um, to get out of my previous job, but I didn't really know how, and I wasn't actually sure what I wanted. So um, it was a really like good process over the, that, um, particularly like the first year, as I was mentioning before, to go through to do different things. Um, as Kevin was saying, you get the ch like, chance to take some risks and some try to different some things. So you might find that you like something you never really even um, knew that you were that interested in. Um, so uh, it was a journey for me. And then I mentioned I changed a couple of times, but um, it was really beneficial. I, I went into a different role, which got me out of my role that I was kind of stuck in. I was there for about 18 months and then I, um, you know, had another change to my current role and I'm really happy with my journey. So um, I think you can go in without knowing exactly what you want. Um, to some of the comments before, you might want to have a, like, you know, a plan or an idea of how you want to structure, how you figure that out. But, uh, um, you know, there were people in my class that knew exactly what they wanted and they went after that. I was, I was not one of them, but I'm really happy to have had the chance to explore. Yeah. So the clear, career explorer path is something that happens in the program as well. So like people that are not 100% sure where they want to go, we do recommend you think about it before you, you approach a program like this and have some idea, but also it's, it's possible for you to change or people that had clear ideas would have a change of mind later on as well. Great, um, so let's see a few more questions here. Does anybody want to talk? Um, so Rujuta has a question about like, um, in your experience, do employers ever wonder why you chose a part-time MBA over a regular MBA? Does uh, anyone have? Maybe I can take a stab at that, Vivian. Yeah. Uh, the simple answer from my perspective is no. Um, yeah, yeah no, nobody's ever asked me that question. Um, not at Deloitte and not even subsequently. Yeah, so it's not like when you do a UBC MBA, most people just say UBC MBA on their resume or their transcripts. Like if you ever feel like the P or the part time is going to be confusing to employers, like you don't have to, you, you, you would just say you did a UBC MBA. It's all part of the UBC MBA family. Yeah, usually um, the most I'll get is if somebody asks, you know, where did you do your MBA? I'll say Vancouver, UBC, and they say, wow, it's so beautiful out there. <laughs> 
So yeah, that's the most. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then, anybody just, else? Yes. I would just also add that um, the, the flexibility of the part-time MBA is actually something uh, we should be mindful of. For example, you show on your slides earlier that you can actually go to full-time classes. So for me, case in point, the finance courses that I wanted to do was uh, during afternoon time. So with some creativity, I managed to go to the full-time class. So it's you're not pigeonhole into doing part-time MBA, the P part of it, and therefore you can only do certain courses. So point one. Point two is that you know the messaging for anyone who, who, who you're going to be interviewing with, I assume that's, that's, the, that's the point of the question is you did the MBA and where is your area of focus? Strategy, finance, whatever else it is. I think that's where, that's where you need to take the conversation versus, versus full-time, part-time. Uh, echo not what you rest said, no one, no one actually cares or really asks about that, but where did you focus in on? Yeah, maybe I'll chime in as well. Um, one of the big benefits that I've, I found uh, uh, from taking the, the part-time MBA um, from my experience was really the cohort classmates in that most of my cohort was composed of, of professionals who had been in, in the workforce for anywhere between five, eight, 10, 12 years. And so the conversations that we had in class were, were very real. You'd have a professor point out or, or teach um, a concept and then you instantly be talking about what you had experienced that day. Or, or that week and you were getting all sorts of different points of view. And so I actually saw that the, in addition to what the other speakers have, or panelists have said, um, you know, the, the, comp the cohort composition of, of the part-time classes and the questions that came up were, were invaluable. So the cohort was driving the conversation as well as the professors. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you for sharing, Erin. Um, we have one more question before I like kind of try to round this up. Um, it's from Tiziana. Um, when you like face challenges during the program, I guess academically, or maybe you had a professional question, puzzle or question you were working with, do you have someone that you can always go to for help and guidance, um, a mentor, for example? What were your experiences, um, panelists, with when you had challenges and, and who did you turn to and how, how were they helpful? Um, I'll, I'll take a stab at that, Vivian. I think, you know, um, the, the first people that you turn to are your classmates um, because everybody's going through this all at the same time. And the amount of challenges, you know, they're huge and everybody has different challenges, right? So there are areas in which we can all help each other out. Um, you know, like one of uh, like one of the panelists mentioned before, everyone's really all in this together. It, it is a kind of a monumental journey and everybody is, is really kind of elbow to elbow trying to get through it as a team uh, rather than as individuals. So definitely, you know, I think first point of contact is, is those people that you're in class with on a regular basis. I mean, it's unbelievable how quickly they will become, you know, your support network, your close friends your colleagues, your allies, the people that you will speak to all the time, uh, both during the MBA and afterwards. And I know it was mentioned already once before too, you know, these are, these are your confidants going forward. Um, my, many of my closest, closest friends are still the people that I went to school with. I feel that will be that way for a long time. Um, I've traveled internationally with several of them on multiple occasions after school. It's just, uh, there's a, a very, very tight knit a community that's built in any sort of program like this. So um, I would certainly say, you know, your, your classmates are, will be a, a massive uh, support uh, for anything that you need. Great. Um, so I want to be mindful of, of everyone's time because uh, we are running a little later already. So I just want to round the whole panel off with, um, well, one question from the, the Q&A, which I think is, is quite interesting. Um, why did you choose the UBC MBA over other programs in Canada? Um, and if UBC was your only choice, maybe you can just give the answer of um, what was your favorite part of the program. So we can go around and just get everyone's decision reasons for why they chose UBC. Um, I could start. Uh, so I, I looked at tons of other programs, uh, why I settled on the UBC part-time MBA. 
uh, was the flexibility and the ability to kind of con continue my career while I while I enhanced it. Um, and and I would also say too, just you know, value for money. Uh, the the network of alumni as well here in Vancouver is deep rooted, and we also have you know kind of like ties to so many other places. So. Um, for me, this was, this actually came down to the only choice, so. Great, thanks, Felicia. Kevin. Um, I researched um, multiple places and I looked at whether MBA or a master's in technology management or something like that, um, but I only applied to UBC and basically most of the same reasons that Felicia just stated, it was um, very good value for money compared to a lot of the other programs. I wanted to do something that was you know, a full-time MBA, like, well, equivalent to a full-time MBA, not an executive one. I wanted to have that full experience. Um, op options for overseas travel. So I took advantage of that, had a like really fantastic time with that. Um, and uh, yeah, the alumni and network. So I think it was a whole bunch of reasons that it was really the only choice I wanted to apply to. Great, thank you, Catherine. Kevin, you wanna yeah, I'll go next. So um, I I only applied to UBC and Queens at the time. Both I don't remember all all the fine details now, but both at the time uh, offer, and I'm sure they still offer part time MBA. What helped me most um, to make my decision was I'll be honest. First was the reputation. Both have mm -hmm. good reputation. No 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 doubt about that. What really tipped over uh, UBC was uh, the first is in Vancouver. Secondly, is also uh, is actually in class program. I think Queens at the time was a virtual program that you go to one of the office buildings where they rented out really good facilities. I would imagine, and and conduct that over over virtual for virtually, which is pretty much what you can do now. Um, so so that was that was that was the that was the decision point for me was more of the the uh, ability to be in a classroom setting to uh, have the interaction with the professors, if you may, and also with your classmates, more of your classmates. Great, thank you, Kevin. Nuris? Yeah, Vivian, so, um, so I, uh, I did look around quite a bit um, because I came to Canada from England. So I also looked at London Business School. Um, I also looked at the London School of Economics. I looked at Harvard and Rotman in Toronto. Um, but I was living in Vancouver at the time and when I looked at some of the other uh, MBAs, I think what I liked about UBC is that the class, class sizes were good. Um, it wasn't like sort of thousands and thousands of students in a classroom, you know, with one professor, it was reasonably sized. Um, so we had good accessibility to prof professors. And also I thought the value was really good. I thought the, um, I think the uh, for what um, UBC charges uh, for fees in comparison to some other schools and what I got in return, I think was phenomenal. Um, considering today, you know, I work alongside a lot of uh, MBAs from Rockman, Harvard, Queens. And when I look back at, you know, when I discuss, when I hear their experiences and some of the things they say, I mean, those schools are good too. But, you know, just looking back at what I got at UBC, I think the value was really, really good. Wonderful. Thank you, Nuris. Um, Mike and, and Aaron? So, um, you know, I, I think uh, for me, uh, UBC really fit my, my personal circumstances at the time. I was still had a, a business and it was local. Um, but realistically, um, I think the, the way the program is structured um, was a big driver for me. Um, mm -hmm. I actually did like the opportunity to do this sort of on the, on the weekends. Uh, rather than in the evening time. And, and for most of us, um, at least in my cohort, that was a real draw too. Uh, so I do like the way that the, uh, that the program is structured. I mean, I have to echo a lot of my colleagues here too. It's incredible value for money, um, very high quality in, in professors. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, all of those pieces really came together. And, and for me, it was, uh, it, it became almost a, an obvious choice by the end of it. Um, what was my favorite part? I mean, there's, I would, frankly, I would do it all over again, you know, randomly if I had the chance. And I think a lot of people on the call probably would say the same thing. Um, but the connections that you'll make and uh, the people that you'll meet, um, 
you know, will likely be uh, lifelong friends of yours, colleagues, and, and, and people that, uh, you know, you'll spend a lot of time speaking to in the years to come. So uh, that was a huge thing for me. Uh, I was a little bit nervous as to who my, uh, you know, my other classmates would be. And it turns out um, UBC does an unbelievably good job at picking cohorts. So um, that that's probably, you know, the biggest takeaway from it all, aside from, you know, career changes, et cetera, is, is truly the connections that you'll make. Thanks, Mike. And Aaron, you want to chime in on why UBC for you? Sure. Um, uh, I think I'll echo much of what Mike said. It it really fit my life circumstances. Um, it it didn't make make sense to step away from Intel. Um, they actually helped me out on my MBA, uh, and and really having audited a uh, both UBC and a few of the other options, this the UBC choice felt like highest value for money. The cohorts were. Um, I think the most mature and and really gave me a sense of comfort with respect to I'm going to get I'm going to be learning a lot I'm going to be challenged um, and I'm going to come out with with my journey of exploration exploration uh, with something of value out the other side. Excellent, thank you so much, Aaron. I, I have to ask this question because it's come up a few times in the Q and A since we started this. But last question: What are your advice for balancing work life and school? Because that's being asked like quite a bit. So, final thoughts on advice for balancing work life and school? I'll give that a shot too. Um, uh, that I would say to me, there's no right answer to that. You know, you, you can hear people say, yeah, you, you need to maintain a good work-life balance and work and family and all those things. It has to work for you. And if you spend more time on schoolwork, so be it. That's okay. Or versus if you don't spend less time on it because you have other commitments, that's all right as well. So the one thing that I um, heard and I still remember quite well is the Pareto effect, right? So you do, you spend a lot of time doing certain things up to a point that anything else after that is diminishing return. So the earlier you can get used to that idea, the earlier you can practice that idea, then that's good. The remaining part is called, is, is to me, the remaining part of that is called your work-life balance. It's called the balance because you don't need to spend the other many, many hours to get the 20% of the mark. Excellent. Um, I can just jump in a bit as well in that, um, like just, you know, at, at the first few weeks can seem pretty overwhelming and, and it feels like a lot at the start, but just probably like every person that's gone through it, there's a point in the first few months where you find your balance and you find, you know, what works for you. As Kevin said, it's going to look a little bit different for every person, how much, um, you know, whether you've got a full family or not, or your job might be more demanding than others or other, you know, life circumstances at the time, everyone is going to go through different things. And our class, my classmates, uh, people went through a lot of different life uh, stages at the time, right? Um, so just, you, you'll find your rhythm, like, you know, don't, at the, at the start, don't get too discouraged because it will happen. And then the other part, I think kind of what everyone on the panel has said as well is, your co your classmates your cohort they will be there for you and everyone is going to have different challenges at different times but they understand what what you're going through so like lean on your classmates when you need to and there's times when they need to lean on you so i think it does uh, does balance out yeah i'll jump in as well yeah um uh, coming out the other side of the program, it, it felt like I discovered that I, and I think a lot of my cohort mates discovered that we have amazing capacity to get stuff done. Uh, coming out at the other side of the program, it was like, wow, I can do so much in a day, um, a week, a month, uh, compared to, to where I went in. Um, now, I'm not going to, like, I'll be transparent about this. This, even the minimum bar workload is going to be a lot of work. Um, there is the Pareto effect or the diminishing return effect out the other side. So you also should be trying to figure out how much you want to put in past that minimum bar. Uh, uh, but really what you do put in is usually what you get out of it as well. Um, the, the other comment that I'd have is that, you know, that work-life balance part, there, there's relationships that, that you value. Um, in life, and you will be able to maintain those relationships. 
Some of them will be spaced a little bit further apart. But for example, um, some of our classmates had kids while we were, they were in the program. Um, I was able to work out and still play hockey uh, once or twice a week. Um, and so there, you can find that balance. It does get skewed slightly. Yeah. I would just um, add that, you know, try to enjoy as much of the MBA as you can, because, you know, for me, um, you know, I've left Vancouver now. I'm in Toronto. I spent a lot of time in New York and in LA and also in London, England. And believe me, I really miss Kids Beach. I miss the, the bicycle lanes. I miss Stanley Park. So really soak up also that Vancouver lifestyle. Um, I think, because uh, I think many of you, following the NBA may move on to other cities, other places, you know, there's always, UBC is very well connected. And, um, but it's always a challenge. I mean, you know, I try to enjoy my work. I try not to think of it as work, uh, but it's always gonna be a challenge, um, you know, when you're going to school, working, but what I would just try to enjoy the campus, the location where it's at, and, and try to get some of that balance if you can. Yeah. Thank you. I would uh, probably piggyback off a little something that Aaron said there. And, and you know, when, when I was at a similar event like this, what you'll hear constantly is that it's like juggling and there's three balls. There's, you know, there's your work, there's your school and there's your social life and you can only hold two of them at once. So, you know, this is, this is a very, uh, a very big undertaking and, and yes, you'll be juggling, um, you know, these aspects of your life, but at the same time, uh, personally, what I found one of the real um, intriguing pieces coming out the back end of this was that some of those friends that I had, you know, not the people that I went through the MBA with, but, you know, the friends I had going into it, uh, we became closer through the end of this. And it's not that we were talking all the time. It's that there's people out there that really want to support you and they see that you're going through something that's, you know, really rigorous. Um, they understand that you can't reach out all the time. So they'll start poking you. Hey, Mike, I haven't heard from you in three months. Like, are you living under a rock? How are you doing? Do you want to go out for a beer? Even 15 minutes. Um, you will strengthen some relationships that way. And so when you come out of it, you know, you'll have a bunch of new relationships, but you really also find out how strong some of those older ones were. So, um, you know, there's no doubt this is a, this is a, a, a rigorous exercise, um, but it's not something that you're going to say, okay, my whole life has now been put away and, uh, and this is all that I have. Um, in fact, uh, I think it's going to be very complimentary. Great. Thanks for sharing, Mike. And Felicia? Uh, I just echo kind of pretty much what everybody <laughs> else has already said. Um, just, you know, around life events, a bunch of us got married. We planned weddings in the program. Like, what were we thinking? Uh, we, st we made it through. We supported each other as part of that. Um, I, I would just say, like, you know, even just as you prepare for something like this, I think it's, and I think, you know, maybe some of us have already kind of started to prepare for a life event like that through this pandemic um but you know being i guess very conscious of even just having some of those conversations whether it's with your spouse or your significant other or other people that you value in life um to set expectations in terms of like what what this experience is going to bring to you and kind of what the time commitment looks like um, but i would say too what, uh, you know, coming out of the program, it's amazing. You, you, you view your time not at work, I think, in just such an amazingly valuable way, um, knowing that, you know, you're able to kind of get done what needs to get done, prioritize kind of rigorously, and, and be able to hopefully enjoy the, the hours that you do get to spend um, on the things that you really value in life, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great points. And like one thing that I've noticed is like once you're done the program, imagine your capacity to do things. Like usually I find people like when they finish the PMBA program or part-time MBA program, you just have so much capacity to organize your life and prioritize. You're taking all sorts of hobbies and things like that. So, um, so yeah, it, it enhances your boundaries in more than one way, both your academics, um, your professional, but also your personal as well. Um, so thank you so much to our alumni panel um, for, for sharing all your thoughts. Um, I'm going to wrap up the session, the alumni panel session. I'm going to stay online just a, little, a few minutes more in case there's any other questions. But um, huge round of applause for our alumni panel for sharing all your thoughts. Um, I wish you all continued success. And um, I hope that we can reconnect again soon, hopefully in person once.
some genius finds a vaccine. <laughs> Bye everyone. Thanks. So I so um, for all the attendees, I'll, I'll remain online just for a few minutes more in case there are some other questions that I can help address. And um, for those of you leaving us at this uh, at the time, if there's, um, I hope to see you again at a future event or feel free to get in contact with me by email um, if there's anything else I can help with. So I'm just gonna quickly check our Q&A chat box. It looks like we have no open questions and our chat is also um, clear. So that's great. So I'm gonna wrap up this session. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you learned, um, you got some good insights into the professional MBA program at UBC. Again, um, this is a personalized journey. So um, please, I rec recommend that you do get in contact with me if you're interested in the PMBA program. My email address will be emailed to you after this session, as well as a link to book a one-on-one -on -one session with me. Thank you everyone. Have a good night.